presentation for Tuesday, October 13th, 2009. We are returning from closed session. At this time, we will open the meeting with the Pledge of Allegiance, so please rise. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We don't have a We do have Spanish translation available. Vivian Rodriguez is with us tonight. Sí, muy buenas noches y bienvenidos de parte de la Junta Directiva del Escolar de Santa Bárbara. Si hay alguien que necesite la ayuda de un intérprete, por favor levante la mano para darle un audífono. Gracias. Thank you. And we do have headsets available for the hearing impaired. You can ask at one of the side tables uh, over here. Um, introductions, proclamations, presentations, or recognitions. We do have two introductions tonight. The first is Britt Ortiz, director of uh, UCSB's Early Academic Outreach Program. Britt, I don't, s uh, there you are. <laughs> Thank you. What? Britt, please come on up to the podium here. Uh, Britt is here to share information on the Algebra Writing Academy he helped coordinate at Goleta Valley Junior High this past summer. Britt, we're glad to have you with us tonight. Good evening. I'm glad to be here. Thank you for the opportunity and the honor to uh, come before you as both a homegrown person, a local Santa Barbara who went to the public schools here in town, uh, being a, a Goleta Valley and a Dos Pueblos graduate. Um, have a little PowerPoint, I think. Okay, so let's go through this really fast. Um, so we, uh, we, ran, we ran Academy this summer. It was a uh, summer algebra academy. And research tells us that uh, we have a couple challenges, and I'm sure we all know this, that uh, students, uh, of course, turn to their parents for advice. But one of the challenges about that is that most of our parents, or a lot of our parents, are first generation. They didn't go to college themselves, but they know that college is good and education is good, but they don't know how the system necessarily works. Another thing, so many students don't do their homework. Ask any teacher and they will tell you <laughs> how uh, incredible that issue is in terms of performance, outcomes in the, in the academic arena, as well as turning into academic failure in the ninth grade, which then, of course, manifests itself in some cases as a dropout problem in the 10th grade. But for sure, if students aren't achieving, they're not working to where they should be for us in terms of the school, as well as for the universities and colleges in terms of being eligible. Uh, of course, algebra is the gatekeeper. Not only is it the gatekeeper to, uh, to the university, but it's the gatekeeper in terms of academic performance in the schools, the standards, uh, whether we want more students to go into math and science or what they call the STEM majors, it is one of the gatekeepers and here are some stats around that. Um, also, research tells us on the upside that with clear uh, career goals and aspirations, students perform better academically, as well if, they, if, if they've identified a college or university, they tend to outperform their peers. So, given the research, I have a model for you that I'm gonna tell you about, and how we can solve for these issues and these challenges that face us, both at the university level and at the edu public education level. First of all, some of our partners this summer, just a few, but in particular, Helen and Will Webster Foundation gave us a $20,000 grant we are very much appreciative of that grant, as well as the work that Lori Hoyle, the uh, campus uh, grant writer, helped us with that to run the academy. Given the challenges that we faced as a, as a school district, as well as a university, we needed an outside resource to try to secure this opportunity. Again, here are some of the college, the other pre-college programs that we worked with over this summer. What's the difference? Why is this so significant? Why did this academy work, or why do we believe it works? First of all, it creates a college-going culture among participants, whether it's the teachers, the students, the counselors. It focuses on this college-going culture. It's a strategic intervention. We're looking at working with students going to eighth to ninth grade, very critical transition, or from the sixth to seventh grade, another critical transition, where we know that we lose students in terms of their academic achievement. And it's research and data-driven. <clears throat> what are the primary goals? One in particular that we don't tell students about is the primary goal. Of course, we say you want to come to this academy because it's going to help you with algebra. But one that we don't tell them, but we, that is one of the most critical aspects of this, is introducing the whole family, not just the student, but the whole family to a college-going culture in higher education. Oftentimes, we have our students in these programs. They learn about the A through G. They learn about financial aid. And they go home to talk to mom and dad who haven't gone to college. And mom and dad can't, can't talk the same language. What this does, it allows for the opportunity for both parents and students to learn about college. 
It's not regular summer school. It's mandated parental involvement during this academy. We see about 85 to 99 percent of the parents coming to parent-related activities for the academy. These are some of the other reasons it's not just regular summer school. Um, what happens in terms of parents? These are some of the activities that parents have to participate in. Uh, in particular, the College Family Night is very critical because this is where students share the work they've done in their college readiness seminars about creating a four-year plan and a ten-year plan. The four-year plan meaning what am I going to do through high school, the ten-year plan, what am I going to do after college when I'm looking for a career. Uh, at the end of program celebration, most summer schools don't have a graduation ceremony. The academy does, and in fact, we see 90, 95 percent, 99 percent of the parents coming. Uh, let me just tell you what's interesting about that end of program celebration. Um, not only at our academy, the Goleta Valley Junior High, did we have 14, 13-year-old boys reading poems about love. Imagine that. Not only did our students tell us that they wanted to come back for more, it was only a three-week program. They wanted four or five weeks if they could get it. Um, not only did uh, uh, parents come up to us and those who were there at the celebration say, you know what, this has changed my child. But we got 13 and 14 year olds to voluntarily give a standing ovation for their teachers, their counselors, and all the student assistants that helped and the tutors that helped in the class. How many times do you see 8th, 7th, and 8th graders giving standing ovations for their educational experience? Um, it's very research driven. We have professional development attached to the model as well as evaluation. In particular, this year we use the CSU UC Math Diagnostic Testing Project to assess pre and post and how they did in terms of math. As well as we have the South Coast Writing Project assess the writing part because we did a creative writing model in the context of this academy. And then we use a college knowledge survey pre and post to see how students did in terms of their knowledge about college going into the academy versus three weeks later at the Goleta Valley or even five weeks later at another academy that you have in the last three years been hosting at the CASA, which is a very similar structure and model to the one that I'm talking to you about right now. The pre and post tests show us how much college knowledge they gained after being in the academy. What's also different is that students apply. They self-select in. Maybe their parents push them in, but they are willing, avid learners to come to this academy. It's not by force and it's not mandated to them. So the Glee Valley hybrid model. One of the unique things about this Algebra Academy and Creative Writing Academy, it was the first in the state to put both creative writing and algebra together in this kind of context. And you also notice that there's 28 hours of college readiness seminars and academic tours, meaning they toured college campuses, as well as learned academic skills, as well as learned all about the four systems, financial aid, et cetera. Here's what the schedule looked like. It was very compact. It was short. It was a short day, 8 to 12 approximately. And we put all that in, <laughs> three weeks. Um, this is another part of the specific workshops. The three that I want you to look at here that I think are most powerful is this idea of exploring California colleges, learning all about majors and universities and how those two work together. Looking at California Reality Check, which is a website where they can look about lifestyle. I want a big house, I want a big car. If I rent, if I buy, what does that look like? How does insurance play into that? And then they start setting career goals and life planning. And here's the trick. We think this is the most important part. This is where students begin to internalize why the why part of algebra or writing or in general school because it's connected to careers and lifestyle. Once the students start doing that, they start realizing why it's so important to learn algebra, to pass algebra, to pass the A through G courses, to get ready and look at a college early on, not later on, and uh, kind of in a de facto fun way. When the students go into this, they start talking about, oh, I want a big family and I want three or four kids or five kids. But after they do this workshop and they create their four and ten year plan, they realize how expensive kids are and they start saying, oh, I want one or two kids now. And so it becomes a de facto kind of birth control. <laughs> but, it, but it really puts in front of them the realities of life and lifestyle and what you want and, and how you're going to get it and how is education tied to that. Brief overview of the algebra lesson plans for the students who participated at the Goleta Valley Academy. Uh, also the idea of the writing that we had, creative writing being an instructional process. It was very interactive. Um, like I said, it got 13 and 14 year old boys to write great poems about love and then some. Uh, when we first started, the students didn't want to interact. They were kind of shy. Uh, by the second week, students were engaging each other. They wanted to talk. They were fighting for time to get in front of the other students to talk. And uh, writing became very important to them. 
We worked very closely with the script um, uh, out in, at UCSB. The teachers were from there. They, they had been through their, their seminars and what have you. Um, and it, it really added to the richness of the creative writing experience. Again, here's an idea. This is all in your PowerPoint presentation of what they did, what they read, what they wrote about. Um, some of the learning outcomes, I think one of the most critical parts of this are, are these combinations of knowledge that the students have gained. Um, four systems, career awareness opportunities, colleges and majors. But the bigger part is that we follow up with these students after the fact. Um, we do talk to them during the school year, we do advise them, we do review. There are after school programs that we plug them into, as well as pushing them forward into the high school to other pre-college programs. Some, uh, one of the pictures, uh, some of the campuses we toured, some of the breakdown in terms of the students who participate at Goleta Valley Junior High versus Santa Barbara Junior High, 31 and 39 students. Here are some outcomes real quickly, but please notice, this is the math these are the outcomes in three weeks of instruction, and in particular, the students at Goleta Valley saw some of the highest growth in decimals, fractions, and integers, three of the most challenging areas in algebra that trip up most students in the learning and comprehension of algebra. The MDTP also predicts future success, that if students have mastered some of these topics, then they should do well in algebra. College knowledge. Uh, here are some of the changes that took place from in, in three weeks the students being pre-tested, uh, what kind of uh, A through G, what are A through G courses? 39% thought they were to get you into college. After three weeks, 71% thought that these are the classes to get you into college. So you see some pretty interesting ch changes. Did it prepare you for school? 74% saying yes. Um, if you didn't get the right classes, what would you do? Well, most of us would like our students to go talk to a counselor. Pre, only 24% would have, I mean, 50% would have gone to talk to a counselor. After, almost 95% are saying they'll go talk to a counselor if they don't have the right classes. Understanding the mechanisms that can help them get into college. The college presentations in general, most of the students, or a lot of the students thought they were very helpful. Also, uh, how important is to finish homework? Remember, I said research says homework is one of the challenges. Pre, 68, thought it was, 68% thought it was important. After, 84% say it's important. Uh, or, or even actually more than that, 97% say it's somewhat to very important. So we really helped the students understand the dynamics. There was a workshop about how important homework really is. Highest level of education, again, you see the students aspiring from pre to post and having a better picture of what they want to do after high school. This is a little bit of information about the Santa, uh, Santa Barbara Junior High Academy that's been hosted at the CASA for the uh, last three years. They've recruited from three different schools. Uh, it's a, a strong emphasis on math, science, and communications, given that MESA, the Math Engineering Science Achievement Program from UCSB, is one of the main factors in promoting this and, and securing this model uh, at the CASA and running it over the last three years. <clears throat> Just a brief history. Uh, one of the critical points I want to show you here, this model started in 2002. We adopted it in 2005. By 2007, UCSB had the most high schools and middle schools participating in the whole state of California in these academies. So we were running nine academies out of UCSB. You can, of course, see what happened in the last two years. The budget has struck, and it struck very deep. Um, without that grant, without some of the support that we see from Goleta Valley Junior High, we understand why the district could and couldn't do things this year, but it was through that collective effort of all these pre-college programs, all the individuals, Mike, Cynthia being very supportive in their efforts, Susan coming and, and visiting the academy and seeing what was going on with it. So it wasn't just us, it was collective, it was collaborative, and it helped the community. So special thanks to these folks. And I think probably one of the most important pieces here is that uh, this summer allowed for a local boy's dream to come true, that a Goleta Valley and Dos Pueblos graduate, me, got to put an academy into my old Goleta Valley Junior High where I went and talked to students about going to college and how that's changed my life and how writing has changed my life and I was able to pass it on. So thank you very much for the opportunity and the presentation chance. Thank All you. Right. Thank you. <laughs> Board members, I don't know if you want to make any comments. Mrs. Deacon? Um, well, first of all, I had the privilege to attend the, the celebration with the parents, and I have to say, listening to the poetry was really a high point. Um, but I, I also just want to express my appreciation to Britt and to UCSB for really working hard to make sure that this, this academy kept going yeah. in the face of the budget cuts because that was very difficult. And the other thing that I'm really encouraged about that a lot of the students that were 
participated in the academy became a cohort that then the principal at Goleta Valley tried very hard to place together in their classes starting in the fall so that they had this momentum going. They'd built these, they'd built these bonds and relationships and I think that was really important. So I would just like to thank you again and the folks at UCSB for working so hard on this. Thank you very much, Suzanne. Also special thanks to, we have uh, Rosa Martinez who, who ran the academy on a day to day. We have Aline Shapiro who's from the Young Writers Camp who helped us co-sponsor this creative writing aspect. Are there any more UCSB reps out here? A couple in the back, wave. Oh, there you go. We got our evaluator in the back, Lisa Figueroa, uh, OAP, and Pathways. One of our uh, teachers in this situation. Oh, okay, even better. Oh, Lois Klein, yeah, right. California poet. And uh, she was teaching our students about writing. And I think this is the piece that becomes so powerful. Uh, we really wanted to help students open that door to their in inside, their thoughts, their heart, and really use creative writing as a comfortable, safe, means to understand what writing is all about versus just writing straight ahead paragraphs. Uh, and I think that made the difference in, in, as Young Writers Camp and Script would tell you, the students, their writing changed over the three weeks. So that was a three week program. If we can get it longer, we would love it. If we can continue to get more support from the community as well as the district, as well as the school, we would love it. We understand it's a very challenging situation. Um, we are going to go back to the, the, the Webster Foundation for another grant for this next cycle. Hopefully we can all have summer school and continue in this effort. And thank you again for all your support and the opportunity. Thank you. We very much appreciate it. Um, I know you had to race through this. This is a lot of information. So thank you for yeah. giving this to us so that we can go through it uh, yeah. and more leisurely pace at another time <laughs> exactly. and follow up with there's questions. There's a ton of stuff, but there's the evaluation information is in your packet as well as the PowerPoint and there's contact information. So please feel free to call us at any point if you would like to continue to explore the opportunity. We definitely will be here. Pathways is on a regular uh, daily basis in Goleta Valley, at Dos Pueblos, at Santa Barbara, so, as well as the junior highs. So they are there on a daily basis and uh, putting in the good effort for our students. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Britt. Well, we also have an introduction tonight. Uh, I'd like to introduce our new Director of Special Education, Carrie Mills. Carrie, would you please come up to the podium here? Carrie brings extensive special education experience to the department. Uh, she will be working with our Executive Director, Tom Guajardo, and with Carol Miller, who is still with us for a number of months to come. She has served as the Assistant Superintendent of Special Education and Student Services in Mill Valley School District. Her prior work includes Director of Special Education of a consortium of four schools and county office at Cal Calaveras County, the Coordinator of Special Education for the Moreno Valley Unified School District, Coordinator of Special Education in Orange County Department of Education, Principal for a special education student, a school, excuse me, special education school in the East Whittier City School District, mentor teacher and specialist for autism spectrum disorders in Los Angeles County Office of Education, and teacher specialist for autism spectrum disorders in the Simi Valley Unified School District. Actually, she's done more things than that, but I, I think that's enough to establish your credentials. <laughs> Welcome to the district, Carrie. Thank you very much. President Parker, members of the board, Dr. Sarvis, staff and guests, thank you for the opportunity to join the administrative team in the Santa Barbara School Districts. I'm really excited to be here and I look forward to taking a positive leadership role in restructuring special education. I love being part of the community and in building partnerships with both parents and educators. Again, thank you. Thank you and welcome, Dr. Mills. Uh, it's an exciting and challenging time for us in special education. We're glad to have you on board. Thank you. Okay, the superintendent's report. Well, let me report on something. In fact, let me start with special education. We continue to update and build the special education information on our website. In fact, a staff contact and email list has been added to that section. You'll hear more about special education in our update tonight. Mm -hmm. I'm pleased to report that our nutrition services department has the confidence and support of a local donor for our school nutrition program. Nutrition Services has received a, an approval uh, for a grant of $20,000 in kitchen equipment 
from the Orfila Foundation. The grant will provide pots, pans, scales, whiteboards, industrial food processors, and other items for use in our kitchens. And I credit Nancy Weiss, our Director of Nutrition Services, for her work with Orfila and her good relations with, uh, with the organization. I think she's doing an outstanding job. We continue to work closely with the Santa Barbara Public Health Department. Uh, you'll see this flyer here on the dais, and we have some over on the side table. Uh, on the H1N1 flu, and are sharing that information with staff and the school community, both on our website and through our electronic news to staff. The county just prepared this new brochure, and more than 6,000 were distributed in our, in our schools this past week. The board brief, I would like to comment on some items on the board brief. Um, first of all, let me say that my office regularly issues a report to the board called the board brief. It is a collection of reports and news and news items on school and district matters. A copy of the board brief is on display in the reception area or can be found in my office. The October 2nd board brief saw a complete set of district complaint procedures. Uh, so, you know, we have a number of them, and, uh, and of course, people can come and complain to the board as well. Uh, so, there was also a copy of the existing board bylaw on majority vote, which we had a question about at our last meeting, which states, quote, the Board of Education shall act by a majority vote of all the membership constituting the board, which means that in most decision making, three of the board members must act affirmatively on that item uh, for the item to uh, have uh, to pass or, or for action to take place. Uh, there are cases where two-thirds of the, uh, well, where additional numbers of board members are required and those are very specific and, and are specified in the board policy. In addition, we included an update on district student demographics, and I will include this next week, uh, this upcoming Friday, a list of demographics school by school, and I think that's, that's most important. And finally, and this pertains to most people in the audience tonight, we provide a report on an assessment of the performance of Cesar Chavez Dual Immersion Charter School. Uh, relative to what the state requires for charter renewal. Uh, I met with the Cesar Chavez board this last week on Tuesday night and uh, further met with the principal, the board president, and another board member just yesterday. The, the school has their own analysis and I have promised to look more in depth at their performance relative specifically to other schools. As you can imagine, uh, there is a good deal of uh, concern about the future of the school, and I bet that's why here people are here tonight. Um, what we will do, board, I will provide in this next board brief, I will provide the backup materials, I'll provide uh, that report, I will provide the materials that were provided for me, to me, by uh, Cesar Chavez and just give you an update on where we are in that process. And, uh, well, this is a report on what we've been doing. I will give you some indication as to when we think we can take that discussion up. My guess is that it won't be until our November 10 meeting, uh, but we'll be able to talk about meeting dates and, and uh, other issues like that tonight. At 10.30 uh, a.m., Thursday, this Thursday, October 15, Monroe Elementary School's PTA will accept a $10,000 check from the Governor's Council on Physical Fitness. Board members, if you would like to be at Monroe School on Thursday at 10.30. Six years ago, only 6.6% .6 of the fifth grade students at Monroe could pass the state physical fitness exam, due in large part to the PTA's support of physical activity and physical education over the past five years, now 46.3%, from 6.6% .6 to over 43 or 46% of Monroe's fifth grade students passed the same test this last year. That's an impressive number. Friday, October 16, is a Career and Community Service Day at La Cuesta High School. Uh, I will be there, and I know a number of board members will be there as well. 
And I'd like to call your attention to the artwork that we have here. Robin, would you please hold that up? Uh, and that we have over on the sidewall. Uh, this is on behalf of the McKinley students in grade six who created their own print designs based on the Ghanaian Akindra cloth symbols. Akindra cloth is a hand-printed fabric developed by the Ashanti people and was traditionally made for royalty to wear at religious ceremonies. Though the years people have also, through the years, people have also decorated the cloths to tell a story and to express their thoughts or feelings. Each piece of artwork contains one design printed 16 times. Did we get it right? Yeah. I'm sure we did. <laughs> Students choose two colors of ink to use in their work, and I'd like to thank the school's art program staff, Angela Lang and Sophie Cohen, for their fine work with students and for coming in today to set up this display for the board. Upcoming events. You have a list of upcoming events uh, on the dais. Dos Pueblos High School's DP Rocks Concert and Art Festival takes place this Friday. Santa Barbara Junior High School's Family Ultimate Science Exploration called FUSE, Family Ultimate Science Exploration Science Night happens on October 28. Goleta Valley Junior High presents Boo, a series of three spooky plays on October 30. Good timing. San Marcos High School's fall play Dracula begins November 13. Santa Barbara High School's production of Pinocchio begins November 13 as well. You'll have to pick and choose between these as we get into the season. Dos Pueblos High School presents Kaufman and Hart's classic comedy, You Can't Take It With You, beginning November 14. And Santa Barbara Junior High School's fall play, Stephanie Hero, begins November 19. You can check our website for the details or for a repeat of this information. And finally, as part of tonight's report, I've invited Ellie Iverson. Ellie, are you here? I didn't see you earlier. Uh, students from Santa Barbara High School to give us a student report. Uh, and are you Ellie? No, but I'm here to give a student report. Are you Arumi? No. Oh, well. <laughs> come up and introduce yourself. Well, please come <laughs> forward and tell us who you are. Here, come on up to the podium. Oh, good. These are students from Santa Barbara High School to give us an update. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Emily. And I'm Yvette Gill. Um, so I guess we'll just give you guys kind of an idea of what we've been doing in ASB um, at Santa Barbara High for the past couple weeks. Um, just this past weekend, we had homecoming, which um, was a really successful event for us. We were able to sell over 1,200 tickets, which is about half of our um, student body population, which is pretty impressive. Last year we only sold 900, so that's a pretty big increase. Um, we had really good attendance at the dance, and um, prior to the dance we were able to put on an event, which we called an aerosol art event, which allowed students who would not normally be involved with homecoming and games, activities like the football game and homecoming court and all that, it gave them an opportunity to get involved in the school and create a piece of artwork that was then displayed at the homecoming dance, which gave them the opportunity to go to the homecoming dance and say, look, there's my art, it's on the wall at the, the dance, which was pretty exciting. Um, we had a really good turnout for that. And also we had our first ever carnival, and the carnival was to replace the homecoming parade due to the budgets, we couldn't do that. And the homecoming carnival turned out really well. We actually sold out for food, which was a major success. And also the artwork for the aerosol art competition was displayed there, and as well as the homecoming princesses were there, and all the sports mem sports teams and bands went. Yeah, so that's pretty much what we're dealing with right now in ASB. And um, one of the issues that was involved with our homecoming parade that a lot of you might know about, we have done it every year for the past, for a really long time. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know exactly Forever, how long. I believe. Yeah, I mean, as long as anyone can remember. Um, we had an issue with, usually the time is donated by the police force to, um, to blockade our, um, our parade, so we're able to 
get the trolleys and the land shark and such to um, to conduct the parade. But this year, um, the police wanted to charge us uh, four thousand dollars for their services, where in the past we've paid um, the services have e either been provided or we've paid somewhere around a thousand, which is why we weren't able to put on the parade and ended up with the carnival instead, which was a pretty big success considering we were able to sell um, the, d the food from the high school um, to create revenue for both the school and ASB. All right. so that's pretty much what we're doing Thank you. Right Ladies, now. Your, your names again, please. I'm Emily Dahl. A Emily. Emily Dahl. Thank you. And I'm Yvette Gill. Thank, Thank you. you, and I'm I'm glad to hear that that you sort of made lemonade out of out of lemons. But uh, it's, I know it's really disappointing to have a tradition sort of pass away because of budget cuts in the city. Essentially, mm -hmm. um, that's that's sad to hear. Um, but thank you. I'm glad it was successful, and I hope you took photos of the aerosol artwork and put it up on the website. I'd love to see that. Yeah, I think we have. We, dot, yeah, we're working on our okay. website right now. <laughs> All right, it's in thank, progress. You. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your time. And I wanted to. <laughs> and I wanted to share just one last piece of information, a uh, message we just received from former Mayor Harriet Miller. She called us to let us know that she was invited to a ballet at the Granada Theater, which was attended by our elementary school students. Former Mayor Miller says that the children were very well behaved, quiet, and better behaved than the adults. <laughs> she was very proud. <laughs> this is the end of the superintendent's report. Thank you. Uh, we'll move on to item C2, announcement of closed session action. We do have one item to report out on item B2, which was conference with legal counsel existing litigation. Uh, in student case number 203-645-0665, it was moved by Deacon and seconded by Heron to approve the October 5, 2009 revised settlement agreement and release involving payment and reimbursement of services in the amount of $4,320 that passed 4-0 with Cordero absent. Uh, moving on to C3, public comments. Do we have any public comments? One, and there's a lot of people out there. You cannot turn in a slip and you want to talk. There are slips on the back table. But Lee Fleming, receive your chat Thank you, and we'll go ahead and close to public comment at this point. Good. And you will have three minutes. Right. Um, good evening, my name is Lee Fleming. I'm the president of the Governance Council at Cesar Chavez, and you're right, that's why we're here. We're concerned uh, and wanted to um, show our support. And also, um, I'm here tonight to show you that um, we really are more than qualified to renew our charter at this time. So I just wanted to highlight one of those reasons why, and that's um, our sixth grade scores. Um, our sixth grade scores are equal to or better than, than similar schools, um, and therefore we have fulfilled the Ed Code requirements to renew our charter. Um, I think sometimes we, we focus on those overall average test scores, but um, as, research, as research demonstrates, um, the outcome of our bilingual approach, um, those sixth grade scores, is a more accurate indicator of our success. Um, the reason why the sixth grade scores are a better indi uh, indicator is, um, one, the, new, uh, the dual immersion uh, literacy model emphasizes reading in students' native language first uh, and then builds on that um, foundation. Uh, two, it takes students in bilingual programs five to seven years, really, to see those test score um, increases due to normal development of full bilingualism. Uh, so therefore, grades um, two and three um, in schools that are English only uh, would have higher test scores um, than the English learners at our school. Um, given this knowledge, uh, sixth grade and beyond are, are better measures of our uh, bilingual students' skills. Last year was our first valid sample size of sixth grade scores, and um, indeed they did score um, favorably when compared to schools with similar demographics. So um, given these facts, we qualify for charter renewal uh, according to the criteria uh, spelled out in the MOU outlining the Ed Code, indicating that the board may choose to renew our charter based on evidence that, I'm going to quote here, that the academic performance of our charter school is at least equal to the performance of the district public schools using achievement data from assessments, including but not limited to the standardized testing and reporting program. Um, our parents are made aware of these same points about the sort of dip and then rise as they come into our school um, and our enrollment increases um, year after year and we have a lengthy waiting list of parents who are, who are willing to invest in that long-term um, academic success. 
um, when our family came to Santa Barbara four years ago, um, we were looking for a school for our children that would prepare, prepare them not just for the end of, of the year, um, but prepare them for the world in a, in a meaningful way and a more long-term <laughs> Um, investment. Um, I'm a professional educator and nationally recognized uh, secondary uh, reform work uh, and I intentionally picked Cesar Chavez for my own children because it deals in futures. Um, I was not looking for a short-term investment and I feel like that sixth grade data and alumni studies beyond really suggest that that our families made a wise investment. So I have for you um, a, a, the programmatic audit that I think you're going to receive but we have it here for you um, including an executive summary um, on the first page. So we really look forward to meeting with you individually to answer any questions you might have and of course we invite you to come to our school to see what we're really about. So thank you. Thank you. Acceptance of donations. Move to approve with appreciation. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Dr. Noel? Aye. Uh, that carries 4-0. Uh, Mrs. Cordero is absent this evening due to illness, and so all of our votes will uh, reflect her absence. Um, moving on to D, any items to pull from the consent agenda? Mrs. Deacon. Uh, D12, please. Dr. Noel? D3, D5, D6, D7, and D13. Is there a motion to approve the remainder? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 That carries 4-0 to approve the remainder of the consent agenda items, and we will return to the items that were pulled at the end of the meeting. Um, item E1, the second reading and approval of Santa Barbara School District's initial sunshine proposal to negotiate with the Santa Barbara Teachers Association. And uh, to our public that are here, if you would like to stay for the rest of the meeting, that's wonderful. If you don't want to stay for the rest of the meeting, please feel free to to leave at this time, we'll, g we'll give a little pause for kids in particular that want to go ahead and escape. I like that. She wants to stay, <laughs> or he wants to stay. I don't want to leave. I like to stay. Really? Good to see you. It's been a long time. I'm going to ask Elaine Alvarado to come up to the podium, if she can. Uh, this is the proposal that you saw uh, on discussion at our last meeting, and we're asking for your action on it so that we can begin negotiations. All right, we'll give her a moment to come up. Yay, you made it. <laughs> so sorry about that. That's quite all right. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm just here to bring back the recommendation um, on the proposal for the action item now for child development and the reductions. And um, okay. So I, I'm not sure if you had any questions or if there is anything we want to, you can address to me at this time. Any further questions on this item? We have seen it before. Dr. Noel. I just want to, uh, oh. I want to make the motion to adopt it, okay? And, uh, and I want to acknowledge uh, uh, the improvements since the last time around, with the greater clarity and the procedure of allowing the week in between. It fits my understanding of the way we're supposed to do it, and I think it's good. I move to adopt it. 
Second. Any further questions or comments? All those in favor? Aye. 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 That carries 4-0. Thank you very much. Thank you. And we are on to item E2, agreement to reschedule the organizational board meeting currently scheduled for December 8th, 2009 to December 15th, 2009. And we've talked about this before and the reasons for this. In fact, we'll get uh, a report from um, the foundation a little bit later about their December 8th concert. Uh, and I've checked legal procedure uh, for us to do this. We need to, uh, to take formal action on it. I move to make the change. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 It carries 4-0. On to item E3, approval of classified child development positions, reductions and layoffs due to lack of funds or lack of work. Again, I'll ask Elaine Alvarado, our coordinator for classified personnel, to come forward to speak to this item. Bringing forth this item um, to um, the board in uh, a, more or less a reorganization and a reintroduction, we had um, proposed lay uh, layoffs and reductions last spring, and due to proper notifications and also due to a uh, change in the budget for this year for child development, we agreed and renegotiated with CSEA to bring back a full component of ch the child development layoff. So many of these that you have seen before, the reductions um, are new to this proposal. Um, these have all been met and we met with, negotiated with CSEA and which have all agreed and to the proposals and to the recommendations that have you see before you. And with the recommendations, we'll be able to uh, provide the notices for the reduction of hours. The, well, the advantages on some of these positions that are being eliminated that they are vacant, so there's little impact or no impact to staff. And um, after this meeting, if approved, we will move forth on 45-day notices for the reduction of hours. Again, that we've met in, uh, with CSEA. Um, Eric Smith and I have met with them and reviewed the, um, the changes that we're proposing and all have been agreed upon. And at this point, we just want to move forward with the recommendations. Board members? Mrs. Deacon? I, I just have a quick question. Could you ex um, give us a bit of an idea of what the housekeeping function is? The housekeeping po uh, positions are, par are part of the, the Children's Centers program. Um, so we're talking uh, the Franklin Children's Centers, Parma, um, early years. Uh, these housekeeper positions are, uh, they help serve food, um, they help just with some clean and maintenance, uh, cleaning, I, I should say, and, and after lunches. Uh, they help prepare um, maybe baby bottles or food, things like that. A lot of these duties can be incorporated and are part of the instructional assistant position um, job descriptions. They assist in, in um, uh, lunch and, and child care, including diapering and other toileting, um, but those are all duties that can be incorporated by the instructional assistants as well. Any other questions or comments? Is there a motion? One question. Mr. Heron. Does, does this reduce the CalSAFE program even more than what we had a public meeting on and voted on? Right. The, the Cal, this, this impact is only to the instructional assistants program um, to the staffing there. This does not impact the program itself. They will remain intact with certificated staff. Board members? Well, as much as we don't like to reduce anything, um, I will go ahead and move that we approve these um, reductions and layoffs. Is there a second? I'll make the second. Right. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. It carries 4-0. Thank you. Thank you. Um, our item E4 is time certain for 8 o'clock, so at this time we're going to do a little jumping around. Uh, the first thing we're going to do is jump to E5, which is board action on student expulsion case numbers 09-1003 and 08-09-59. On case number 
On case number 0910-03, I'll move for the stipulated one calendar year. Um, expulsion. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 That carries 4-0. And in case 0809-59? I'll move to lift the suspended expulsion and implement the expulsion recommendation of the administrative hearing panel in case 0809-59. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 That passes 4-0 as well. Um, at this time, uh, if board members do not object, I would like to jump to item G on the agenda. Um, everything else that's on here are things that either we need presenters to come in on, that we may have public speakers on, um, and E4 is time certain for 8 o'clock. So if we could see if we can take care of items from the consent agenda at this point, oh. that would be great. So item G is return to consent items designated for discussion. So let's go ahead and do that. And the first one on the list was D3, approval of staff travel, out-of-state travel, and or expenses in excess of $500, dated October 6, 2009. And Dr. Noel, you pulled that? Yes, I pulled that. Uh, I wanted to understand better this expenditure at Harding Elementary School, $13,632 uh, being charged against Title I professional development. Uh, and part of that's maybe just that I, I, my association of Title II with professional development rather than so much of, uh, with Title I. Um, I can explain that. Number one, um, we found out today because uh, Mr. Heron also asked about this item, that that $13,000 off the bat is kind of a um, enlarged cost because it's a little bit padded in case. So for approval, you know, we do that kind of thing so we make sure we cover it. It actually will be a lot less. But you're asking about Title I being used for that. And you can use Title I professional development there at a Program Improvement School, you have to have 10% of your okay. Title I go directly to professional yeah. development. No, I forgot. I didn't make the connection that they are a PI school. Uh, and this is, all right, that answers that. Answer. Yeah, thank you. I yes. move to adopt that. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. That carries 4-0. Then there was D5, approval of Academy of Healing Arts proposal at Laquesta Continuation High School for the 2009-10 school year. Dr. Noel. Uh, I have no quarrel with this, the substance of this, but uh, in this case and in several others, there's something that's not entirely clear. Uh, it says physical impact, no physical impact to the district unrestricted general fund. And then we go down to the what it is, it's a pupil, in, pupil retention block grant, which is a tier three flexibility item, which means that is he, in, for all intents and purposes, the general fund. T and yes. I think that should be clear there. That th this money could indeed be spent on anything from which general fund money can be spent. That's forward. correct. And technically, you're right. And I think in the future, when we, we um, use people retention block grant for La Cuesta's expenses, we should make that crystal clear because for the next three years that will be the case. La Cuesta right now operates entirely on pupil retention block grant. That's all the money they have. Um, it's gone from $235,000 last year to 88000 this year for these types of operating expenses. Yeah, yeah. So it is that tier three, it could be, it is, you know, the general fund at this point, but in our working with the school, we've carved that out substantially and they're working within their means with that. Any further questions? I uh, move to adopt it. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Dr. Noel? Aye. Uh, that carries 4 0. Then there's uh, D6 approval of agreement between the City of Santa Barbara, City of Goleta. Santa Barbara School Districts and Police Activities League regarding the conduct of the junior high school after school sports program for the 2009-10 school year. It was I again. Uh, question on this one, and, and I think uh, Mr. Smith can clarify it, but my recollection is that we usually, when we have these contracts, have a clause in them that says that, that we become something like the primary beneficiary. We have to be named in the insurance when it's someone else getting the insurance. 
and if if that understanding is correct I don't see it in here generally we insert a clause not only do we include an indemnification agreement but if we're requiring them to get insurance we'll have a, us listed as an additional insuree and I'm not sure if this verbiage includes it or not but that's pretty much been our standard policy. I, I, I scanned it I didn't, I didn't read every word but uh, I'm not sure if it's uh, under A, I, or I didn't see it under number six, maybe. Yeah, and, it's and under, I, I actually it is, view if, if, if it's what, under A, protects us most. it's under A, I, where it says where extension of coverage of the city ah. of SB, and it says officers, agents, and employees as additional insurance with respect to PL liability, et cetera, et cetera. Further on uh, on A4, you have uh, okay indemnification and hold harmless provisions. Page four. On uh, a a top four. top of page three, at the very top oh, of page okay. three. Okay. Oh, item four. Okay. Yeah, I'm, usually I'm you sorry. would see that called out explicitly, but I, it's embedded I in that. I that item at the top of the page at that point. Okay. I'll second it. All those in favor? Aye. 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 That carries four zero as well. D7, which is the approval of agreement between the City of Santa Barbara Parks and Rec Department and the Santa Barbara School Districts for the 2009-10 Recreation After School Program. Dr. Uh, Noel? I, is that same I issue about the language of, physical, of the physical impact? In this case, I see I struck out, I just said it's no physical impact in, in, in general, right? Right. Right. That's correct. I, I just, I find that those impact statements could be more forthcoming. Or well, I, this this one actually doesn't cost us anything. Yeah, that's right. So it's no physical impact. Yeah, in general. Oh, in general. Okay, yeah. we've been using the you know unrestricted general fund. It's just kind of a clause that we put in everything. Our secretaries put that in when there's no, no funding, yeah. but, and, 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 but just no cost at all. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I move to adopt. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. That carries four zero. Um, next, I believe, was was, D, was it D12? Approval of special education consultant contract for Steve Menharis, and that was Mrs. Deacon. I was hoping uh, Mr. Wajardo would be willing to come up and talk to us a little bit about the responsibilities that would fall under this contract. I do want to note also that his um, Menharis is spelled incorrectly. It has a Z at the end. Well, that's it then. <laughs> can't hire. <him>. Sorry. <laughs> yes. Um, as as you know, um, I was hired in late, and Dr. Carol Miller just started yesterday. And uh, Dr. Carol Miller has been here um, as a consultant and uh, has been putting in a, a, a yeoman's amount of work and done an exceptional job. We still have one special education director to hire. We're not going to settle for just anybody. It's a difficult time of the year right now. Um, to find somebody quality and especially uh, able to move at this time of the year. And so we want to make sure that we have some quality people in there. And uh, Mr. Menjarez has been um, in special education for about 32 years. And uh, I've participated in a couple of statewide committees with him. And uh, uh, he's got statewide uh, recognition for the work he does. Um, Dr. Miller and, uh, and Mr. Menjarez and I have sat down and talked about um, how we can divide this up because in essence the two of them together would equate to the third special ed director that we have not hired and um, as you know there's a lot of uh, quite a few um, settlement agreements that that, that uh, Dr. Miller's been working on and really has not had the opportunity to see above the water and really take a look at how we can better use her skills and her skills are in systems, her skills are in organization, and she and I have been uh, discussing that. So what Mr. Minhares would bring in is um, some expertise, uh, especially at the elementary level, some expertise in terms of um, organization. Um, I don't know if you were aware, but we've lost um, our, our secretarial staff pretty much, three out of the four up there. And we need to not only, we restructured from the directors and the program specialists and they're on board, but we really need to restructure the secretarial help. Uh, we have an autism class that was approved. 
And um, fortunately, we were able to, to find a quality person to hire, and now we're trying to locate a, a space for that. And uh, Mr. Menjarez has opened three autism classes in Goleta. Um, so he w his responsibilities would be to, to assist with the autism and at the elementary level. And the way we've designed, uh, if you remember in previous conversations, we have three comprehensive high schools. So the three directors, me included, will take a high school with the junior high feeders and the elementary. And the reason why is because we want to be able to support the sites and see the full articulation because that was one area that staff has expressed to me and in the FICMAT report was expressed, the lack of articulation. So that I would take one strand, Dr. Mills would take another strand, and between the two of them, since they're both part-time, Dr. Uh, Miller and uh, Mr. Menjarez would take the other strand, and so that's what we're looking for this evening. I see, I see here it's not to exceed 40000 Do you anticipate spending that full amount? Or um, right now he's a retiree, and there are some STRS um, require or, uh, stipulations on that, and I believe it's somewhere around $30,000 close to there. So I don't, do not anticipate him going over the 40000 perhaps not even over the 30000 mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Dr. Noel. Uh, on that note, I, I, would have, I would like to see at what rate we're paying, the $40,000 or $30,000 for how many hours of work. Mm -hmm. uh, we had that very clear in, the, in our uh, contract with uh, Dr. Miller. And uh, I think that I think that should be public information. Mm -hmm. uh, in general, uh, I'm sorry to see this in the consent agenda uh, because we're not, somehow it's not being treated the same way we treated our last hire uh, of a consultant in this area. Uh, I have not seen this person's resume. Uh, I have not heard a report on uh, on recommendations uh, or anything. And uh, so it's just, I, 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 would, I would rather have seen this as a handled the same way we handled the last two or three appointments. So we'd have a, a little more knowledge, uh, not that I'd, question what's been said, but it's just it's nice to be able to go through the paper and, you know, and read the letters and uh, uh, see, see what the background is and, and so on. And I, so I'm very uncomfortable with this. Uh, without it, without it, uh, there's no job description. Uh, I think I'm kind of speaking to Mrs. Deacon's point. Uh, so uh, I'm not going to vote for it, but I would like to have, see us have this person. I'm, I believe that uh, the argument is very plausible that this person is is, uh, is just perfect for this for the job for this thing, but I just don't think I don't think the groundwork's been laid for for us to move on this tonight. I can't do it, Mr. Heron. I'm more concerned now than I was when I came in with your description of the organization, because the FICMAP report was really clear that you're on the top, and we have a director for elementary and a director for secondary. And now we're hiring a consultant whose specialty is elementary, and I think uh, Dr. Mills is elementary. Um, where is secondary? Where, where, and, and you're talking about you're going to have in your position a high school, a junior high school, and elementary under you? Correct. That, that's not FICMAT report. Have we changed the FICMAT report? Well, keep in mind those are recommendations from FICMAT. The other piece that I didn't mention is we have three program specialists that will be assigned to each of us, and those three all have secondary experience. So our thought was the combination of elementary secondary experience would make a, a perfect match for that. Well, that's, you say there, Wait, those uh, are Dr. recommendations. Dr. Noel, Mr. Heron still has oh, the floor. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, we hired three specialists, two for secondary and one for elementary. Now you're t saying the three are going to be different than what the FICMAT report says? No, we didn't hire. We didn't hire. Uh, an elementary program specialist and two secondary. We hired three b best people, but and Fick they happen to be secondary. Well, FICMAT says two for secondary and one for elementary. Have all, has this been gone through the stakeholders group? Have this been talked about, There's a change in structure? Well, again, FICMAT with recommendations. My understanding and the direction that the board gave FICMAT or the uh, stakeholder group was to go through prioritized um, combine any, any or delete any of the uh, duplicates in there. As far as the implementation stage, I don't think that was the direction of the board. 
No, you're correct. We, but the board, the board specifically voted on a structure at a, special, at a separate meeting prior to FICMAT even coming out. It was very mm -hmm. specific structure. And your description of the structure is totally different. Now, which it may be correct, mm -hmm. but it sure bypassed all of us. I was not aware that that, that structure had been uh, uh, approved by the board. Obviously, that was done before I came on board. Actually, yes, it was done when was it last April? Or even March, I think, because it was one of the very first things we did. And I don't think anybody from special education that is currently <laughs> here would ever have known. Um, so I, I think I personally would feel more comfortable if we maybe got a report on why it is that you are uh, thinking of sure. reorganizing that. Um, and then also that would give us the opportunity to get f more information about Mr. Menares. Um, and maybe that could come back to the next meeting sure. if it's not time critical. Be glad Madam to provide President, that. May I, yes, may I Dr. request Newell. that this not be on the consent agenda? Oh, absolutely back? not. Yeah, we'll get a full report on it. And, and just one other comment mm -hmm. is, I mean, I have no problem with, with Mr. Uh, Mahara's, mm -hmm. but I guess I have a problem with consultants. I mean, at some point, special ed has to bond with parents over a long period of time. And we've been through several consultants and parents can't bond. I mean, we, we've got to stop using consultants and get a permanent staff in here as soon as possible and get the staff. But, but I, I, I take a little bit of issue. I would hope each of you, I hope you've read FICMAT, and I hope all Absolutely. of you have read FICMAT because it's really clear as to what the structure is. So, I, I Absolutely, and we can come back and uh, give you some more information on the, uh, the consultant and as well as a... Uh, a proposal as to why we we are thinking of changing direction on this. All right, uh, Mrs. Deacon, we have a time certain item for eight o'clock, so uh, we are going to go ahead and leave this for now. We'll come back to it, um, and we still have D thirteen waiting for us on the consent agenda. But we again, we will return to that at the end of the meeting. Um, so with that, we are moving to item E four which is the Notice of Public Hearings and Approval of Resolution Numbers 0910-19 and 0910-20 regarding William's insufficiency of instructional materials for traditional calendar schools of the Santa Barbara Elementary School District and Santa Barbara High School District. And Michael Gonzalez, our Director of Student Services and Compliance, will present this. Uh, thank you. Uh, on an annual basis, we are charged by the Education Code to conduct a survey of our instructional programs to ensure that all students in the K-12 system have access to primary textbooks in the core areas defined as reading language arts, mathematics, social studies, and science. In the uh, uh, junior highs, we're also required to make sure that uh, health, that there are sufficient health instructional materials and at the high schools, we're also required to make sure that there is sufficient uh, laboratory science, foreign language, also including the junior highs, as well as health. We conduct, a, as you may recall, we conducted such a survey uh, about a month ago uh, for our year-round schools. We're presenting to you tonight the results of the schools that are on a traditional calendar. I will share with you that uh, on the basis of the findings, we are recommending to the board that we are forced to adopt a resolution of insufficiency both at the elementary district as well as the high school district. In the elementary district, we found that there were two schools in particular, uh, Harding School and the Open Alternative School, that did not have sufficient materials for all their students, and that's embedded is a, in the cover memo as well as in the summaries that are provided for you as well as uh, part of the resolutions. We also found that uh, at Dos Pueblos High School there was uh, two courses that have insufficient materials. I also want to share with you if you'll permit me This morning, we were notified by the Santa Barbara County Education Office who visited three of our schools as a result of the Williams Settlement. You may recall that the Santa Barbara County Education Office is charged with visiting 
our decile one to three schools, one through three schools, which includes three schools, McKinley School, Harding School, and Franklin School. There's, their uh, 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 visits occurred last week. This morning we were notified, uh, and I summarized it on that sheet, that they also found that there was instructional materials missing at each of those schools. I've delineated on that form the grade levels involved, the materials that were involved, and the particular uh, uh, textbooks that are missing. The district is charged with making sure that uh, we have a system in place to make sure that while these textbooks are being purchased or found, and I'll explain that in a bit, that uh, students continue to have access to grade level materials. For example, at Dos Pueblos, what they're doing is they're using one classroom uh, set of textbooks for two sections of that uh, Spanish for native speakers as well as the IB program. That does not meet the requirements of the Williams Settlement. The Williams Settlement and the legislation say that students have to have not only a textbook that they can use in their classroom, but a textbook that they can use, uh, take home to use. And so uh, the results are that uh, we are recommending an adoption of two insufficiency resolutions, and you have that before you. I shared with you that uh, the uh, legislation behind instructional materials say that we're obligated to make sure that we uh, use any instruction material funds that are available for that. And if we have exhausted those funds, we can turn to the categorical programs, the title programs, the federal programs. So this will not uh, impact the general fund, i.e., the funds that, that were previously mentioned, the state categoricals, it will impact the instruction materials fund if we have exhausted all those funds, and it will impact these, the uh, federal categorical programs. Um, embedded in the documents that are presented to the board and made available to the public is a summary of each of the grade levels by school and uh, there's notes at the bottom that say specifically what was missing at each of the schools. Questions? Well, first of all, this is a public hearing process. Um, so I'm going to do that technical aspect right now, which is I'm going to open the public hearing on this item um, and see if there are any public comments on item F, uh, sorry, E4. No, there are not. All right. With that, then I'm going to go ahead and close the public hearing and um, take board member comments and questions on this. Um, I'm going to chime in with a few then. Um, well, one of my questions, well, th two things. One is you've gotten this notice today from the county ed office. Um, I know that particularly in the elementary district, it's really hard to track textbooks because there's no barcoding system and it's sort of where, where are they buried in what abandoned classroom are they located and what des desk do they get under. And I think that um, that has proven to be really difficult. Um, and so I guess one of my questions is, are there any plans to try to improve that process so that we can keep better track of elementary textbooks in the future? Let me share with you that, yes, we are in the process of developing a plan. You may recall at one time in our district, uh, and a number of principals do support this, but there's a cost involved. At one time, uh, instruction materials were centralized in the district offices, i.e., the district offices uh, counted the number of students and ordered those materials. You may know that as uh, staff was scaled back uh, in the district offices, many of those responsibilities were placed on the schools. The result has been exactly what you've outlined, that uh, materials sometimes are misplaced, materials sometimes are lost, as I've indicated in the memo. And uh, there is a group of people, the, though as your compliance officer, I am charged with doing the, uh, the background that results in this, it's actually the curriculum folks that are going to be addressing the uh, storage uh, and the solution 
that we're taking a look at. Uh, as you know, we have three people currently involved in the Instructional Materials Curriculum Department, and uh, I, I will share with you that many of those textbooks that were reported as missing have been recovered by doing exactly as you outlined, searching different schools' uh, storage areas and getting those books up to OAS or getting them to Harding. However, we have not completed the entire task. By the way, I should share with you that with the county, we are obligated by the 20th of October, which is next week, to outline to them how we're going to take care of that. Their standard uh, solution, of course, is order the materials. And we will do that if we need to do that. Hopefully, we'll find most of the materials because there has been a decrease in enrollment. So I, I don't think we're going to impact our uh, funding sources that have outlined in a great uh, in a significant manner. And then my other question is, um, with the, this new list from the ed o uh, county ed office, we have a written resolution here that doesn't include this information. Co do, do correct. Do we need to amend the resolution? Uh, I, I believe that that's the appropriate, and that's why I outlined, uh, I distributed to you, as well as copies in the back, those should be part of the resolution. Again, the resolutions are for insufficiency, and that's the primary uh, uh, vehicle that we're using to notify the Santa Barbara County Education Department that indeed we have found that there are not materials, and we will amend uh, this document before we submit it to the county. Mr. Heron? I'm just curious how the county found these, and we didn't know it. Uh, we're still, I met with one principal today to exactly uh, broach that subject. I was not able to meet with the other two principals to uh, discover what is the reason for that. I will share with you that what the county visitors do is they actually walk into a classroom, count the number of students, and ask, let me see your textbooks. And so it's a, it's a very classroom by classroom kind of search. We will provide you, of course, with a, an explanation um, and a follow-up. Thank you. Um, board members, for the elementary district, it is resolution number 09-10-19 that we would need to approve um, with an amendment to include the information from the county education office. Is there a motion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. That carries 4-0. And then for the high school district, and here's another question for you. It's still listed as the high school district. We are now the Santa Barbara Secondary S School District. Um, when is that going to go into effect for the um, interactions that we have with the state? I, I, I think I'll defer that to, to uh, the people I report so you to. You can defer it to me. Um, no, we haven't uh, received final word back from the state. We're anxious to make that change, and, and we've notified them. So we're thinking that we should be going ahead and calling it the secondary district at this point, but uh, it's not official at the state. Okay. Uh, so we need a motion to uh, approve resolution number 09-10-20 for the Santa Barbara High School District. I will make that motion to Second. approve. Uh, Moved by Deacon, uh, sorry, moved by Heron, seconded by Deacon. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. That carries 4-0 as well. May, may I make one additional comment? We also requested instructional material surveys from our charter schools. We're not required to report that to the board, nor are you required to uh, certify. When that data comes in, it will be sent to you. Thank All you. Right. And Mr. Yeah, Heron? When the county makes their inspection. Is that a surprise? Ex ex uh, uh, two of them were announced. One of them is a surprise, and that's the method they use. They always announce two prior, and one is completely unannounced. And when they announce it, what does the principal and staff do as a result of that announcement? Do they make any checks? They uh, make a full comprehensive search. I, I remind you that what a Williams uh, check does is essentially check for three basic areas. It does a facilities check to ensure that we have clean and safe campuses. It checks instructional materials, and you saw the results. It also checks the credentials of the teachers to make sure that our students are being taught by properly credentialed teachers. This was the finding, specific in instructional materials. 
Okay. Well, we've been so good in the past, we'd, we'd do once in a while not to do it right, but our, our overall uh, job is tremendous. Thank you. And thank the principals. <laughs> thank you. Uh, with that, we're moving on to the conference agenda, item F1, discussion of lockdown of San Marcos High School and security at Santa Barbara School District's campuses. Good. I'm going to invite Norm Clevenger to come up to the podium. This last Thursday, we had a citizen who, in driving through the uh, shopping center across the street from San Marcos High School, uh, saw what he thought might be a, a student who was threatening someone with a gun. Uh, this, the students moved toward the campus. Uh, he came, reported immediately that, uh, that one of the students may have a handgun. Um, the community resource officer was on the campus. In fact, the witness, uh, as the witness was entering the office, uh, ran into one of the APs. Uh, the AP contacted uh, Officer Hudley and the school was immediately locked down. There were a number of operations then that, that took place that were headed by the county sheriff's office. One was an investigation, the other was a, a closure, and the third was really a, a SWAT uh, sweep of the campus. Uh, I have Norm here to recount some of the details, uh, but what we wanted to get to very quickly was that in the end, uh, thanks really to our students for, for their, their great behavior in handling uh, some very difficult situations um, during the extensive lockdown because it was a long period of time when they couldn't leave the classroom, they couldn't go to the bathroom, we, we couldn't get food and water to them. Uh, and our teachers and staff at San Marcos High School, uh, they were able to wrap up most of the details in the investigation and determine that in fact there was no handgun on campus. In fact, it was a sport drink bottle that had a black, black cap to it that had a black cover and that would look from the distance as if it might be a handgun. Uh, and that was good news, uh, but even then, we did final sweeps of the campus. When I got to the campus, I learned a couple of things, and, and the, the primary lesson that I learned was that the principal operated as the chief communications officer with everyone on the campus. So he was on his computer uh, sending emails and responding to emails from all of the staff members. When the school went into lockdown, he immediately requested that staff members determine whether their students were all present and safe. They did so. Every time we got an update, uh, then he would send that update out with the information that we were allowed to get out to our staff and let them know that this will continue. There were a lot of things we, we couldn't tell them. Uh, at the time that he got that information out to staff and then people would respond to him. So he'd typically send out an update by email to staff members and then there'd be an all call on the uh, PA system asking teachers and staff members to check their email messages. So that was a critical point of, of keeping in touch with our people because in a situation like this where everyone is locked down, including the administration being locked down in the administrative offices, uh, it's very unusual that you can't walk out on your campus and look to see how things are going on. You know, in a fire drill, you spread out and you make sure everyone's followed their directions. Uh, in this case, uh, they, have, they have had previous drills. Uh, they're expected to respond to a certain type of an alarm by locking the doors, by closing the blinds, by turning off the lights, by being quiet, uh, to go into a lockdown, and then not knowing how long that's going to last is, of course, a very unusual uh, condition. The other lesson that I think we learned from our end uh, here as a district office was the need to provide a lot more information to parents even though uh, we weren't getting information very quickly, even to go out with the same information I think would have been more comforting to parents. Uh, we used, uh, well, the school used and, and we used the telephone calling system to let parents know what we knew. 
And uh, we really should, I think my goal in the future will be to do that every 20 minutes, to put additional telephone numbers in so that it isn't only the telephone, the home number that gets entered first. Uh, we did provide information on the website and people who went to the website were able to get that information and the updates. We'd like to provide that in the future to parents through emails as well so that they have all modes of communication and get this information through whatever mode they're using. You know, some parents are not at home, they're at work. Uh, some parents are using their cell phones. Some don't use their cell phones uh, at work and uh, are on email and would be checking their email. So it would behoove us to, to work to get all of the information we can to parents as frequently as we can. With that, let me turn this over to Norm, who I thought did an exceptional job. Um, Norm and his staff uh, were, well, you know, here Norm had his campus really taken over by the Sheriff's Department. And, uh, and they were in a support role in many ways, but they were still, uh, still carried primary responsibility for the, the staff and the students at the school. Norm? Well, it's just one of those things that, um, it's quite an experience, and I, I don't mind saying I would prefer not to go through it again. Um, but I think what was most gratifying for me is that we had, and I was happened to be on the telephone at the time when the witness came in, uh, talked to Jennifer uh, Foster, one of our assistant principals, um, and it was hard to tell how believable this this witness was, but obviously they came forward to make this statement. So the first thing she did was call for Harry Hudley, our resource officer, and thank God he was there on campus as he usually is. He came down and within a minute talking to the gentleman said, lock it down, and we did. So for us, that's a, a, a long bell that continues on, and then on the all call, uh, we make the announcement, uh, this is a lockdown, this is not a drill. And within five minutes, there was not a soul on campus that you could see anywhere. So all the kids were in classroom, all the kids were locked in, and um, most of the sheriff and some highway patrol and police department were either there or on their way there. Uh, shortly thereafter, they had closed down the streets close by. Uh, SWAT was showing up. Um, we had a number of officers coming in to that we were dealing with at the time. Uh, at that point, uh, you know, we had the information from the witness. Uh, police department interviewed him a couple of times. We kept him there. He was actually there for five or six hours with the rest of us um, so that he could be a, a part of this. Uh, and, and I think the, the consternation that Mrs. Uh, Foster felt was because the, the gentleman was actually visibly shaken. So it was hard to tell whether he was ill or what his condition was, but he was scared. You know, he'd seen what he thought he saw, and he was reporting that, which, you know, uh, obviously we always want people to do. Um, and the information was that four students, three with backpacks, one uh, Hispanic male, short hair, white T-shirt, and black baggy pants, which is almost, you know, half of our school on any one given day, but that was the description we had and he had seen these kids coming to campus. Uh, so at the lockdown, um, SWAT then obviously was going around on campus first to ensure that uh, there was no one out there uh, that was gonna be a threat to anyone. And secondly, to look every place possible, garbage cans, bushes, everything else for a possible weapon that had been stashed. They eventually went up on the roof, they went everywhere. Um, while this was going on, obviously, uh, we did get a description of uh, the students. So then I emailed all of the teachers and said that we're looking for four boys with this description. They would have been either entered or brought into your classroom because one of the things that we instruct teachers to do, when there's a lockdown, they go to their door to lock it, they look outside, if there's any student anywhere around, they grab them and pull them inside. Um, so. Not all of the students were in their class necessarily. If there were kids who were just coming to school, uh, they were all pulled into class. So we made it, sent the description out resembling this that would have been pulled into your classroom either just before or just after the lockdown. 
and we got three responses of three different rooms where students matching that description had come into the room at that time. So then the police officers went out on the campus into those classrooms, took those students and brought them back down. I think we originally had seven or eight students and eventually through all of the interviewing ended up with the four that had been actually seen in the beginning. Uh, but clearing the campus, making sure that there were no threats outside, there were no, uh, you know, weapons anywhere, and then assuring that we had indeed the four suspects in the office, uh, you know, under, you know, under the sheriff's care, took probably three and a half hours to four hours. And it was at that point they were satisfied that there was no threat out on campus. Uh, there possibly, until we know any further, there might be a weapon somewhere in one of the classrooms. So it's at that point then we emailed the staff, uh, said that we're going to be moving you to another location when students are going to go with you and police officers will come to your room and move you, uh, ask them to leave all their belongings behind. So that was the instruction the teachers gave to the kids to leave their, their book bags. Now kids, some of them had their cell phones in their pockets, that wasn't a big deal, but we did want them to leave book bags and anything that could actually you know, hold a weapon uh, and keep it not visible. And then the officers started moving them you know, one classroom at a time, either up to the gymnasium or to the uh, auditorium. And there we were able to obviously give them bathroom facilities and uh, water and food. And we got those to them. But that was quite a long process in the way that they were doing it. And, and make no mistake, uh, Sheriff's Department was in charge. And so we were working with them. I didn't, I wasn't allowed out of the building till after four hours. And that was only to go with an armed uh, escort to make sure that all of the doors on the outside of the auditorium were locked. That's the first time I got to step outside. Uh, we did, after about 45 minutes in, send a teleparent message home to all the parents, letting them know that, yes, the school was on lockdown and that students were safe inside the classrooms. And please don't call or come to the school because you will not be able to get on campus. And that we would let them know as soon as it was clear for their students to leave or for them to pick up their students. Um, so this progressed on till about Four hours in, when they started moving kids into those two other locations, once they were all safe in there, uh, they did, all of the four suspects were in the library. That's where they got picked up and put in. The police officers went through and checked every book back, every nook, every cranny, every possible place in the library for a weapon. And twice. Twice, twice. yeah. And they did find the sports bottle. And it was actually something that the young man had just purchased at Vaughn's, had the receipt still in his pocket. Uh, it was a black sports water bottle. Uh, and that was sitting there on the counter where he'd brought it in with him. Uh, so ultimately, at that point, it was pretty close to a little after 3 o'clock. Um, they gave us clearance, and they weren't sure at that time whether they needed to do any more searching in any more of the classroom for a weapon or not, but they decided that we could let the students go, but we were not to let them back in the classroom to get their materials so they could come back the next day. So we then sent another uh, teleparent message out to all the parents. The buses will be here at such and such time. Your student's going to be excused. If you want to pick them up, they will be sent over to Vaughn's parking lot where you can pick them up there. Uh, and then we had students who had driven themselves, and we did it in shifts. Those that were walking or taking the bus went first, and then those that were driving themselves or had come with a student who had driven them went last. We did have the uh, other uh, aspect to deal with, which was students who had left their keys in their purses, their book bags, back in the classroom. So we had uh, seven, we had four, five administrators and four campus supervisors and we divided up the kids into areas. We took them down to a wing. I took uh, the E and F wing and I took all a, a group of about 15, 16 students with me, went to a classroom, I unlocked the door, they went in and they could grab their book bag or whatever and then I looked in it before they left with it. So we did that at each one of the locations and everyone was able to 
you know, get their keys so that they could get home. One of the issues that we did have and, and we tried to work through with MTD was there were students who then wanted to get on the bus, but their bus pass was in the classroom. And so we did work something through with them that let the kids ride free, let them come free in the morning. If there's an issue, we'll take it up with MTD. But there's extenuating circumstances here why they don't have their bus passes. So all in all, at about, uh, oh, I think it was 5 o'clock, 5.30, where we had a discussion and they, the law enforcement decided that through their investigation, they had the suspects, they had uh, the water bottle that they believed to be the only implement that was mistaken for a weapon. They had no reason or cause that would allow them to search all the rest of the students' belongings. They said we could if we chose to, um, you know, 2,000 backpacks or whatever that would amount to. So at that point, uh, Brian and I had a conversation to say that wasn't necessary for us to do if they felt things were safe. We did then contact our teachers that evening. In most cases, the students' purses, backpacks were sitting right on their desks. So they could come in the next morning because this was first period where this happened. And that was where they were going to go next period. In some cases where they'd had some activities in the class and they'd moved the desks around and the book bags were kind of everywhere, we asked teachers to come in, take all the book bags, purses, and put those behind their desks so that they could give them to the kids when they came in the next day. We didn't have any incidences of kids losing their purses or book bags and all of that. So it, it worked out quite well. In all, it was uh, quite an interesting day. Could I make just a couple of other comments? Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, the resource officer is, is funded by the, by the county sheriff's department. Uh, that person's with us full time on that campus, courtesy of the county sheriff's department. And we're thankful for it. Uh, secondly, special provisions were made for our special education students. We had special day class students. Uh, some students have a particularly difficult time um, adjusting to a uh, new routine. Uh, in fact, in the end, when our students were moved, uh, our special day class population went first. They had their buses right up front. They were walked directly to the buses. Uh, but, you know, they were locked down along with everyone else. Uh, Another group uh, of students that we have special provisions for were students who had physical needs, health needs, uh, students who were diabetic. Uh, we identified those students, made sure that they got drinks and snacks, made sure in the end that they had their testing equipment or their pumps. Uh, there was another population on campus, uh, the nursery school kids, uh, and we didn't have an all-call system for those parents. We had to go to the teachers so that the teachers could contact people. We did discover uh, two of the classrooms didn't have the, uh, the, the speakers uh, that were connected. We've, we've since rectified that. Um, I mean, you discover all these little things. In fact, uh, you know, the staff, again, the, the staff was just stellar in all of this. Uh, the staff, I think, did a great job in debriefing and, and determining all of the areas where things could be improved in the future. And we will be using, in fact, we met with the secondary principals so that Norm could talk to them about lessons learned this morning, and we will have uh, other meetings to that effect. We uh, met as a, an administrative team the next morning, Friday morning, and then we had a chance to debrief that afternoon with the Sheriff's Department. Uh, and talk about their part in it. And I think it was also a learning experience for them because there's a lot of them that have not been through this particular type of training and they were, of course, involved in it. And then Thursday, f we moved some staff development around so that we could have a debriefing with the whole staff last Thursday. And I think what was most gratifying um, when we have our meetings, we always start out with good things to share. So we start on a positive note. And so this was no different. We wanted to share positive stories that happened in the classrooms. And it was just amazing how great our kids were, uh, how much they supported each other, how much they were cooperative. You know, as, as trying and as difficult as that situation must have been, the kids were just superb. And I have to really uh, pat uh, our staff on the back because Regardless of how they may have felt, whether they were nervous or scared or anything else, they certainly didn't let any students see that. And they were rocks in those classrooms for 
you know, five hours, most of them. And uh, th I think that was one of the reasons that the kids were able to hold it together better and, and be cohesive. And it was just amazing, some great stories about kids sharing stuff and food and gum and, um, you know, as, as uncolorful as it may be, you know, we had some makeshift restrooms that were made up in, in the corners of some of the room with waste baskets and sheets uh, because of the necessity some kids needed to, you know, needed to go. and. You know, the sheriff's department was not going to let a soul out of that classroom until they were certain that everyone was absolutely safe. But it was a it was a great, great to see how well the staff. I mean, I understand nobody likes the drills, and it's kind of an interruption to you know the curriculum that we're trying to provide. But um, they were just spot on, terrific. Thank you, board members. Mrs. Deacon. Well, I, I would also like to commend the staff for their professionalism, for maintaining calm in what was really a scary time, and the maturity of the students. I mean, we saw the students really rose to the occasion, and together they all worked it out, which was fantastic. Yeah, they did. Um, I do have a couple of, of thoughts about things to do differently next time, and you've also, you've already mentioned, Dr. Sarvis, the need to update parents more frequently and probably sooner, too. I think maybe the first message in hindsight, could have gone out a little bit sooner. I also think it would be nice to have some s staff trained here at the district offices so that when Barbara Chiani goes out to, to be in the field, we have people who are trained so that when calls come in, there's always a live person answering the phone um, because we want to make sure that they get to talk to somebody if they call the district. And just finally, I, I I'm thinking about the resource officer that you had, and to me that really underscores the fact that we need one at Santa Barbara High School. Because I think that was really instrumental in, in really immediately was. mobilizing the law enforcement component of the this. The second person to arrive on our campus was the resource officer from Dos Pueblos. Yeah, so. see? Two, we need yeah. three. <laughs> okay, thank you. In fact, could I comment on uh, a couple of those? Um, staff training, we do have the cross training and, and as a matter of fact, Barbara Keani's phone was broken, went right to message and uh, Norm had to make other calls, uh, but it, it was, it fell then to Michael Gonzalez to, to follow up and it was Michael Gonzalez who came to alert us. Um, the, the point of information uh, is, is sometimes uh, held up because to get real information to parents, uh, depends on what the sheriff's department wants people to know as well. And that takes a long time. I'm always amazed, and I watched it during the fires and I watched it again as we were piecing together our messages. Uh, it took so long uh, in the evening when we were finished, just as an example, that we thought it was too late to put out a call at that point in time. We should have put out a call anyway. Uh, you know, our parents told us, well, 10, 30, 11 o'clock, we still would have liked to call. Mr. Aaron. I'd like to thank Dr. Sarvis for letting us know. The first email I got was from you, um, and I think that helped because then we were able to know what was going on. So thank you for that very first message, and then Barbara carried on after that. But the thought process of, of keeping us informed, I thought, was very, very good. Any comments, Dr. Noel? Uh, so how will we, what would you do to prevent a future a, a incident of this kind? If you had your brothers now, what, what kind of planning, what would you put in place well, I don't know that would about minimize the chances of this happening again? I don't know how I would minimize the chances of a false report. I don't know that I would have any control over that. Um, the only thing that I have control over with, obviously, is what's done uh, on our campus. I did have a long conversation with the four students about uh, what sort of attention they draw to themselves when school is started and they're an hour and 20 minutes late to class and they're in a parking lot across the street, they are obviously going to draw attention to themselves. So we did have that conversation and of course they drew a lot of attention. One of the things that was somewhat ironic about this situation and uh, the students in the course of this event, um, the witness saw them 
having kind of a, an exchange with a car that was moving through the parking lot. And that's when from behind they thought the student took something out of his pocket that looked like a gun. Turned out to be the water bottle. Um, when they got to school and were locked down, and they heard it was locked down because of a weapon, their first thought that the people in the white car must have had a weapon. And they became scared. And so it was a difficult time for even the sheriff's department to get you know, their involvement out of them and to really understand that, yes, they were the four boys that were seen outside. I don't, you know, to, and back to answer, trying to answer your question, I, I think that there are a number of things that we can handle differently after a lockdown starts, but I don't know about doing anything to prevent that on the onset. Well, let's take a different scenario. What if it were someone with a weapon who was intent on getting on the campus? Uh, like a Columbine or a mini Columbine? Uh, the events were just the same. I mean, that's normally what Lockdown is what we practice is for an intruder on campus with a weapon. That's what lockdown is for us. That's why we lock it all down. That's why we don't let anybody out of the classrooms. That's why everything that happens for the first two hours is that if there's danger, it's outside the classroom and everybody else is locked in and the police come and take care of everything after that. So the best thing that we, that we can do is just to be able to lock down when someone shows up with a gun. We have, I would say yes, that's the best thing that we can do. I mean, obviously you, our, our first responsibility is to keep kids safe. Do you take seriously the uh, findings in the Healthy Kids survey that uh, were the reports by a small percentage, but still an absolute number, a positive number of kids who say they have brought guns to campus? Um, obviously, we are always on the lookout for that possibility. We're always trying to get information. We're always following up on any mm -hmm. leads, rumors, uh, suspicions that anything like that ever takes place. Um, I don't know what we can do except react to uh, things like that. Obviously, we try and uh, have a rapport with our students so they're willing to have conversations with us. That's one of the reasons it's always great to have uh, the resource officer on campus because he has a lot of uh, connections with these kids that allows him to get a lot of information about things that go on in the community. And, and you, know, you know, what we're talking about here is not necessarily a school issue, but a community-wide issue. But it's right, it's, it's part of every campus that we have that that may happen. You don't, do you think restricting entry to the campus might help? Reduce risk? Um, you know, that, that's kind of a tough question. I, I think that, that two things happen. And in, you know, 36 years now that I've spent in high schools and I've been on some campuses that you almost have to have a, a, a card and somebody vouched for you to walk in the front door. And there are, you know, big iron, wrought iron gates around the outsides. I think that that sort of sends a message and also sends a different tone uh, to the kids who are on the campus. Um, and I'm not so sure that what we have in this community warrants that. Obviously, it's not my decision. Uh, but, you know, I've been doing this now for 36 years. I've been 19 years as administrator. This is the second lockdown I've been involved in. Both of them were false alarms. Now, you know, I'll knock on wood because I'm very glad that they were both false alarms. And I obviously read the papers and listen to the media, and I know that that's not always the case. Mm -hmm. So you're, I, I, think, I think the public would like to know then uh, that you're content that we're doing everything we can do. I believe we are. I believe we, within our, our resources and what we can do and what's viable, uh, in our community with our kids, we're doing a heck of a job of keeping them safe and content on our campuses. Mm -hmm. I think we have three of the safest campuses almost anywhere in California. Um, I'm just going to piggyback on what Dr. Noel is talking about because I have concerns not just for the high schools really, but for every single one of our campuses. Um, in our district, the schools were built very open and it's um, it's almost impossible um, to restrict access the way 
I think that we would if we were rebuilding these schools now. Mm -hmm. But I do think that it's something that we need to think about in terms of just ways of uh, limiting. Uh, maybe the next time that we, when we're planning for the next bond in terms of security for our schools, um, what are things that we learn from this lockdown and what are ways that we need uh, to to limit access to a certain amount so there are fewer gates that you need to close and things like that if uh, if there's an emergency on a campus or if we're worried about an intruder. So that is something I'm thinking about too, Dr. Noel. Um, in this particular case, first of all, I want to say to Dr. Hayden, I'm so glad that we had Teleparent. I am so glad that we had Teleparent. I mean, a year and a half ago, we would not have been able to do even what we did. Um, and I'm just looking forward to, we've used it so many times now with the fires and um, now with this, um, it's it's just terrific that we have this as a resource and one that we can continue to develop and improve as something that we can connect with the community and with parents with. Um, some of the things that you say alarm me for our other schools. We have schools that have classrooms that are not wired for email. And so when I hear that that was a critical component of how you were communicating with staff, and I can completely see why, um, then I think about our schools where you know, sorry, the kindergarten wing would just have been out of luck. Um, we, we did have uh, some substitutes on our campus mm -hmm. who didn't have access to email and we had to phone them. Okay, so they were on, uh, used phones for them. Yes. Um, then there was uh, the issue of being several hours in the classroom, most of them with no food or drink, and then the toileting issues. I know that La Colina has essentially an emergency mm -hmm. toilet system in place, uh, something in each of the classrooms. And this is sort of a district question. I don't know how La Colina paid for that. Um, I don't know if it was site funds or if something their PTSA put together. Um, but I think it might be uh, a good idea uh, for, for in people fact, to think about it. In fact, we're planning to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, we're planning to buy 100 kits so that we could move them onto the campus. We know that we couldn't do that immediately. We wouldn't care about doing that immediately. I mean, student safety comes first. Getting the SWAT team there, getting the campus secured there is important. But in this case, just as an example, at the point that we were gonna move students to the gymnasium, we knew that the gym would be too hot if we were going to move most of the 1,800 students into the gym. Uh, so we made arrangements, special arrangements, for our trucks to come in with a number of fans. And while there isn't enough security personnel to escort students from each classroom to the bathroom and back, bathroom and back, I mean, you'd go through hundreds and hundreds of students, uh, there would probably be enough at some point to be able to deliver these kits to the classrooms. So we will do that, and I understand that at La Colina, those kits that always seem so funny and out of place in the corner of the classroom seem pretty appropriate right now. <laughs> um, we can do that for about $3,000, and we will do that. We'll locate them centrally so that we could get them to a school. Great. Mm -mm, Mrs. Wassey, I just that? wanted to add, too, that today we had our secondary principals meeting, junior high and high school principals, and Norm shared, you know, what he's learned from this and all, and that particular topic came up, David Ortiz shared how they were using them, and several of the schools actually are planning on purchasing their own, in addition to what we might have at the district for, you know, other instances, but just so they're there in the classroom. So they're about $30 a kit. In fact, Norm e already emailed the website how to secure those. So we're moving on that right away. Great. Um, what I would, I'm sure that there was a lot of discussion that the other principals brought up, lots of questions that they had for you. I would love to see, I don't know if it would be in a board brief, um, or maybe just simply when the safety plans come forward to us as sort of a summary at that time. Um, that was another thing that came up today, and we were thinking um, that maybe Barbara Chiani could put together, she's been in all of, most of our meetings that we've been talking about, lessons learned, what happened, you know, that kind of thing. So we're going to try to put that together for a board brief. That would be excellent. Dr. Noel. Yeah, I, I, uh, I didn't uh, express my, my respect for you and all of your staff, uh, because I sat at home and followed this the best I could. And, kind of had visions of what was going on. I, 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 were you out, you were trapped too, weren't you? Yes, Dr. Sarvis was well, trapped. Well, uh, only an hour 45 minutes into it, and I didn't get the full brunt of it. I just assumed uh, 20 minutes it'll be over. Oh, an hour it'll be over. <laughs> well, it just wasn't over, it wasn't over. Yeah. And at the time that I got to campus, 
there wasn't a soul moving on campus. There was a helicopter circling overhead. Uh, there, were, there were people in uh, officers in flak jackets and very big guns uh, standing guard on campus and moving around campus. I mean, it gave it a very different feel for even, uh, even a, a, an earthquake drill on a campus <laughs> or something like that. Uh, mm -hmm. So, yes, uh, I've sort of forced my way onto campus and... Um, uh, and then had to force your way off. Well, I said, you, well, you don't want to arrest me. <laughs> uh, but then I was in the same situation of being locked in with the other administrators. Uh, and that is a strange, as an administrator, that is one of the strangest things not to be able to go out and check to see what's going on out there. Yes. I, I, I wanted to just reflect a, a couple of things. Uh, I, th I believe we should limit access. Uh, I don't know how those kids got from Vaughn's parking a lot over what entrance they took at San Marcos where they come up around the parking circle or came in the front way. But if, if they couldn't have gotten in without going past somebody, uh, we probably wouldn't have had a problem. Uh, now I recognize that that changes, the, that can change the tone. Uh, the last time this was discussed, uh, one board member and one of your colleagues at another high school said fences make schools like prisons. If that's the case, we've got some pretty high-performing prisons out there with a lot of high school kids in them, but because uh, an awful lot of good schools have fences. Uh, my underlying view is shaped by my own area of studies, and it is simply that it, you, you have the risk of something happening and you have the consequences of it happening. And somehow you combine those to come out with a, an assessment of, of expected loss or expected uh, risk or, uh, damage. If, if the consequences are catastrophic, okay, then even a very small risk isn't worth taking, or at least you price it out. What's, how do you reduce risk uh, in the face of, of catastrophic consequences? To me, that's the problem we have. To me, losing a kid is catastrophic. This, this all, I, I was a nuclear strategy specialist in my work at the university, <laughs> okay? And, and, and this kind of line of reasoning comes from catastrophic consequences, low risk. How do you minimize the risk? What's it cost you? If it's, if it's, if it's disproportionately expensive, then you've got a different equation and you would make a different ruling. I, I, think, in, I think at least a, a reasoned approach to looking how one not, not necessarily enclose them entirely, but how one can reduce the risk uh, and what the costs would be is something that would behoove us to do because the con consequences are potentially catastrophic. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Mr. Glevenger, and thank you so much to your staff. Um, that was tremendous. And I have to say that I think most of the board members had the opportunity to see what was happening in the gym by looking on YouTube. Um, and uh, it looked yeah. like the day ended uh, rather pleasantly, actually. So um, I, uh, I think I would have rather been in the gym than the auditorium, I have to say. Um, but I really appreciate that you have shared your experience with us and hopefully none of the best, none of the other schools have to go through what you have, but it's going to be a tremendous resource. Well, I can only add that our students are always upbeat and resourceful. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. One public comment. Okay. And we do have one public comment on this. Mr. Wheeler. Thank you, Lane Wheeler, President of the Santa Barbara Teacher Association. Um, Santa Barbara Teachers Association would like to express their uh, thanks also to administration, to Brian and Barbara for uh, keeping us in the uh, communications loop. Uh, Brian and I had a conversation about making sure that we were at the very beginning of that information chain. Uh, and I did thank Brian for the call that he gave me, I think about 6.30. He sounded like he was pretty well spent from a, a tough day and uh, my advice was try to check out Harry's because I think that probably would provide some <laughs> some solace there. Um, we would particularly like to thank the law enforcement uh, officers that were there. They did a very professional job. I've talked to a number of teachers at San Marcos. I, given the, the stress that they had to um, 
the stress of the, the uh, situation they had, they did a very commendable job and we are very thankful for the partnership that we have with the uh, public law enforcement agencies in, in the Santa Barbara area. Um, I, I, I think we heard staff being thanked several times today, but I would like to just wave that red flag because we all know that the captain of the ship uh, certainly is what's going to keep things afloat and stable and uh, at the, the good job that we kept hearing about the students doing came from the responsible attitudes that those teachers took and the in, uh, inventiveness that they took in dealing with situations that were well beyond the daily, the daily job description of, a, of a, uh, an educator. And we'd also like to thank the classified people who were there. I would like to con have the conversation continued for what are the needs of, of the educators in the situation. If you've ever had your house burglarized or been in an accident, you know, sometimes two and three days you come back and you go, oh, that's missing or oh, I didn't see that scratch. And, and I think people are going to, as they reflect on things, continue to, do, to you know, dredge up those issues. Um, I asked Brian if they'd have support services, mental health support services there. Completely had that there the next day, so we thank you again for that. Um, one of the things that was really key, I think, in this whole process, and Mr. Heron's been very, I think, uh, on the cutting edge of this, is the need for good technology in our schools. And you heard how heavily the success of this plan worked because of the technology, not only the hardware and software to make the connections, but the training that was there for those teachers to make sure they were able to get that information and respond in like. So once again, I think it just speaks for the need for that. So keeping SBTA in, the, in that information link at a very early point, uh, Ms. Keani and I are now on our BFF uh, friends list and uh, uh, you know, I think the, the board understands and district understands the importance of that. And once again, to thank those teachers and certificated staff for the absolutely outstanding and excellent job. I am a parent of two kids there, and they both came back singing the praises of their teacher, which a junior and senior in high school don't do often. So thank you very much. Thank you. All right, board members, at this time we're going to go ahead and take our break. We're running a little late, so we'll make it a 10-minute break instead of 15. Moving to item F2, the update on status of special education. And Tom Guajardo, our executive director for special education, will lead this report. Good evening, members of the board, Superintendent Sarvis, Associate Superintendent uh, Sawaski, and Deputy Superintendent Smith. Um, last couple of weeks have been, uh, have been quite, quite busy. We've got a lot of professional development next week. We have uh, Nick Martin coming in, and Nick was here last April, and I went through and talked to some of the staff that attended and saw some of the feedback. They said phenomenal. So Monday and Friday of next week, we're doing facilitating IEPs. Um, and uh, we've opened that up. Uh, uh, we want the, we have administrative designees at each of the school sites that are, um, in charge of special education there as, as far as the administrators go. So that'll be um, the prime target there. And then Tuesday and Thursday afternoon of next week is part two of what happened back in April. And uh, so we have uh, quite a few people signed up for that as well. Wednesday, uh, the Alpha Resource Center is uh, working with Nick on advocacy. And Tuesday and Thursday morning, we, are, we put together a customer service presentation. And that's one of our big pushes as a district this year, and certainly in special education, to work with, uh, with, with parents, to work with uh, students and, and staff. And so that will be offered um, for the clerical staff. The special ed department sta uh, staff will go through there. We've also opened it up to district office and uh, any of the sites on a first-come basis. So all of next week will be in professional development. And the second big item is the uh, this year welfare special education self review, and we put together a team uh, cross section of administrators, speech, uh, nurses, uh, psychologists, and so forth. And we had our training last week, and we'll be meeting with parents to get input on that as well. And uh, so it'll be a real busy year for special education, and uh, the special ed self review will take quite a bit of time. Any questions, comments, board members? Dr. Noel. Yeah. the uh, rest of the board and the public would be, would be helpful for them to have a 
short report on the process that's been going on. The, uh, with the work with oh, um, Dr. Miller will follow up with, with that on the thick magnet stakeholder. <laughs> Are you kidding? You don't want to see me the whole time. Come on. No, Dr. Uh, Miller will follow up on the FICMAT stakeholder group, and she's got a couple of other activities to report. Hey, another thing I, I think would be very... Another thing I, that I personally would find very helpful, and I think the public would also, since we have uh, basically new people, yourself and now Dr. Mills, and uh, I, at some point, I think it would be very nice to have uh, you folks talk to us about the FICMAT report and give us your reading of the FICMAT report, uh, the insights that you draw from it and, uh, and uh, uh, an evaluation of it if you think it's, it, it omits or misses some points. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I would like to hear that and uh, maybe you're not the person to ask, or doc, uh, ask a Dr. Sarvis, but uh, I think that would be very, very useful. Mm -hmm. I think we can debrief tomorrow morning and perhaps come up with a plan of action, uh, Superintendent Sarvis. Mr. Heron? Well, uh, where do we stand on the parent resource posi position? Um, the last, uh, if you remember, we, um, we added more salary to it and uh, we adjusted the job description because we wanted uh, a little higher level. Um, so that, um, the job description, I'd have to ask personnel and see what we are with that, and I can certainly follow up and let you know on that. Okay. Mrs. Deacon. Um, well, I would just pu publicly like to thank Mr. Guajardo for joining me and Mrs. Cordero at a meeting with Pueblo a week or so ago. Um, Just Communities also had a representative, Padres Unidos did. There was a special ed parent there and her daughter, and really the genesis for the idea of holding one of these community meetings in Spanish came out of that meeting, although probably good minds would have gotten to that point anyway, but still, I, it, was, it was a good meeting and I appreciate Mr. Wajardo getting out and meeting members of the community with us. I wanted to allude a little bit mm -hmm. to uh, Mr. Heron's concern earlier about uh, a different approach to perhaps the structural organization mm -hmm. of special ed, and I personally am also not averse to looking at it in a different way. I think maybe I was surprised, as was I think he, to learn that, that the structure was different than we had anticipated and originally based on, on approving the FICMAT report. So Dr. Noel's request to, you know, to hear more mm -hmm. from you about your responses to that and, and how you are then generating your ideas about way to structure the department would be useful to us. Uh, absolutely, we can come back with a proposal and share that with you. Okay, thank you. Th thank uh, you. Dr. Carol Miller. Good evening. This last two weeks has been very busy. Um, we held a joint resolution session with a parent, advocate, and school administrator and have resolved a state complaint cooperatively. Um, I facilitated two IEP meetings and those were resolved and we resolved some outstanding um, issues, answered many phone calls and emails and went to some very productive meetings. Um, yesterday we had our second stakeholders um, work group and at the first meeting on 9-28, uh, we broke into five ad hoc subgroups to study the 153 FICMAP recommendations by category areas. And then the subgroups came back to the full work group and we presented our priorities and mostly they were A, that means that uh, we need to implement them immediately. Um, <laughs> as well as there were lots of duplicates and consolidations, but we just ran out of time and we didn't have any time for discussion. Um, and so yesterday, uh, the work group got together again and we validated the subgroup's work. We made corrections as needed, um, talked about some suggested language um, and addressed some other areas. Uh, and then what we did uh, was uh, the work group members were asked to prioritize different categories using yellow dots, placing the yellow dots on their most important item. And you could place all five of your dots on one item if you wanted. We had uh, several uh, top priorities. The first was training, and that received 57 dots. Organizational supervision got 23, and we had a tie for two, uh, for place two. Communication and information resources also received 23 dots. IEPs, 17 dots. Instructional assistance, 15 dots. And programs, 10 dots. 
and then we had um, the other areas that got less dots. Um, then we talked about uh, the community forums, and I distributed a draft flyer, and we had a very spirited discussion um, about the community input forums, what the purpose was, and what the language on the flyer should be. And we um, looked at some more workable dates and times, and we have come up with three dates. Um, and the first will be Monday, October 28th at Lacumber Junior High School. Uh, the second will be November 2nd at Goleta Junior High School. And the third will be Wednesday, November 4th. Originally, we talked about November 5th, but we could not find a site because it's the day before voting. So November 5th will be Wednesday uh, at Santa Barbara Junior High School. Um, the third meeting at uh, Santa Barbara will be held in Spanish with English translation. Where will that one be? That's going to be at um, Santa Barbara Junior High School. Dr. Miller, I, oh, you know, I might be reverse. It may be Galita. I need to check on those. Um, the first one on the 28th is actually a Wednesday. Oh, it's October 28th the, is a Wednesday? I just remember we moved the Monday 26th in case anyone's oh, taking Wednesday. that down. Oh, Wednesday. Okay. I'm still having my uh, flyer proofed. Dr. Noel? It just yes. occurs to me, uh, are there any east side, west side problems that could affect the attendance? Uh, because I didn't hear anything from the west side of town, any meeting on the west side of town. Lacumber Junior High School. Lacumber, oh, Lacumber I it Junior High School. I beg your pardon. Right. And then we talked about uh, the community forums and the purpose. And these forums are not under the Brown Act. And we want to make them as friendly as possible. Um, also, um, we will have other avenues for public input uh, to provide comments. For example, they can send emails to me, uh, written input, uh, as well as phone calls. Um, and basically, uh, we will um, ask the public to provide comments, not necessarily on the 153 recommendations. We will make a reference, though, if they are interested in getting that information. We will have car hard copies available, both in English and Spanish, at the district office. And of course, we've got that on our web page. Um, and then, regarding the distribution of flyers, uh, we distributed, we, we brainstormed on how we could distribute uh, the flyers. Um, of course, through community agencies, parent organizations, our teleparent message in both English and Spanish, uh, post on the district website and uh, the Santa Barbara um, E News. Um, have principals um, be our conduits uh, to um, publicize them at the school sites. Make sure we include our uh, secretaries in the front office, in f uh, including other mailings, for example, PTA, PTAS, PTSA announcements, um, and also uh, send an email to all of our department chairs to distribute. We will provide copies as well, enough copies to all the school sites so the teachers can put them in the students' backpacks. And we also are going to make an announcement at the ELAC meeting that is going to be held at Goleta Junior High School on October 20th and any other relevant meetings. And then share the information at the um, CESR, the self-review uh, parent meeting that's going to be held, I think, October 22nd in the evening. So we, we would like to um, spread the word as much as possible. We'd like to get as much um, feedback and, and public input. Then after we're done with that, we will bring our work group back together and synthesize the information um, and, um, oh, I forgot to mention all of the uh, recommendations that were made and the, and the uh, consolidations and transferring recommendations from one category to another. I will be integrating those documents and having a new document within, within the week. Then after our community input form information comes back to the work group, um, hopefully we will be ready to develop our implementation plan. And that's my report. Thank you. Mr. Heron. I'm just curious. You, you mentioned that training, organization, communication, et cetera, were priorities. Correct. What does that mean from the, a practical standpoint? It, you said training is number one priority. That's basically getting a sense of where the group was feeling. Uh, if, if we put all of our money or all of our dots into one area, what is the most important priority at this time, uh, where would we um, put a lot of energy? Um, it wasn't a vote. It was more kind of like a, um, a straw consensus of, well, of guess, where our energy would go. I guess my question is, you know, programs was way down on the list. I just picked that one out. 
Correct. What if programs one of the, is number 10, uh, yeah. 10 dots. But what if there was five. one item in 10, in, in programs, that was absolutely necessary? How would it ever see the light of day? Yeah. In, what, if, what if the number one thing on the organization, uh, I presume is ombudsman, but if that doesn't Correct. come until after you deal with training, how, I don't understand and, and priority by groups rather than priority by item. And, and it really wasn't a vote or something that, that, is, in, that is going to be prescriptive. It's, it just gave us a sense of are we on the right direction. Okay. And what we really need, to, and, and we were thinking of putting dots on the individual areas, but it would have taken a long time. We just kind of wanted to get a sense. Yeah. I just want to make sure that if there's a really top priority item that's right, in one correct. of the lesser groups, they say, oh, well, we can't get to that. Great. And, and there were some assumptions, too. For example, disability awareness category. We collapsed that entire group into other groups um, because there was so much duplication. We felt di disability awareness was really important to all groups. So we didn't put dots in those areas. And then um, some of the areas, for example, um, advisory groups. We thought that was really important. Um, but, you know, we, there but are so some single the, areas. But that's in the second category organization. Correct. Correct. But what if that was the number one item that everybody wants? Yeah. When would you get to it? And, and we, we will continue that discussion when we get back at the, at the third meeting. Yeah. There's a lot of unanswered questions. We have a lot of discussion. Dr. Noel? Yes. yes I, I, uh, I question this pu the public forums. Okay. Uh, and I base my questions are based on experience, uh, having gone to some public forums that were organized to get, to get input from people. Uh, and in this case, one of them was a public forum that uh, Bill Gillespie co conducted, the first such forum in the, in the development of the FICMAT study. And about six people showed up. Uh, uh, I think there was only one uh, Hispanic person. Uh, I remember another public forum that the only people who showed up were two st high school students who were assigned and, uh, and the translator. So they became the forum. And, and, I, and I worry about that, uh, just the attendance issue, that's one. Then the other part is, if you get the people there uh, and you show them in one form or another the FICMAT recommendations and ask them to react, uh, for the life of me, I can't see how uh, some very important groups, subgroups, uh, are going to make any sense out of that whatsoever. Uh, I would think that for people who don't sp speak English, people who uh, have a limited uh, education, uh, people who don't know our system, people who aren't accustomed to, uh, to uh, speaking out in public meetings, people f who are afraid of microphones, uh, people who don't want their identities known, uh, won't, just won't open up. And, and, and I think that to get them to open up, it has to be a very informal, uh, loosely structured uh, in, uh, meeting. Uh, and, as, and we have to be very, very patient to let people who are, to, to let people who are not quickly forthcoming have time to speak and get the people who are overly quickly forthcoming to be quiet because they're intimidating. And, and back to the, to the main part of it is the FICMAT rep recommendations, uh, I mean, I have trouble rela relating to them. I do too. <laughs> <laughs> Um, in response to your concerns, I, I went back and reworded the the flyer, and then I bounced it off of a few of, of the folks that, that had concerns. And instead of benchmarking it on the FICMAT recommendations, um, basically it's um, we need input from folks. We're restructuring special education. And we did have a study conducted last year, um, and there are recommendations available. They can have access to those if they want to see those recommendations, and they have been on the web page. But we're looking for input and recommendations on when we develop the action plan. Uh, basically, it's the community input is to gather Im input for a special education action plan for restructuring special education. So this is not under the Brown Act. Um, 
it would be co public comments on all aspects of special education or special needs, actually, because we do have 504 students as well. Mrs. Deacon? Yes. I think we cannot but have these community forums. I mean, clearly, I think that's a mandate that we need to act upon. I agree that an informal setting would be really useful, and I think we talked about this last night, that an in informal dress, you know, not a huge distinction between district folks and families. Um, if there's not a big turnout, we can put chairs in a circle. I mean, just make it really hospitable and welcoming. Mm -hmm. And I, I want to make sure that we're there to answer questions from people, not just to address complaints and concerns, because I, I'm hopeful that there will be people who come who just want to understand how to navigate the system. And um, we talked about having a desk off to the side or a table where people could go and speak one-on-one -on -one if they weren't comfortable speaking in a large group. So, I th and, and I also am hopeful that given the turnout at the last FICMAT um, session where there were so many people that we're now using some of those folks who helped bring, Correct. get yeah. that turnout there to get the word out. And, and I know Jacqueline Indo was there last night and she's gonna work with us on that. So I'm hopeful that we will get a good turnout. Um, but I, and, and just getting back to this dot piece and, and, uh, <laughs> and, and the priorities, for me, it, w it was more just a validation of those things that bubbled to the top as, as really striking people as, as the overriding concerns, but that's not to say that items buried within some of the other categories might not be critical. One thing I think it's important for us to let people know about is how many things are already being done, because some of those things already are in place, especially the structural and organizational pieces. And lastly, I would just like to make a pitch, and I guess it was no consequence, um, not a coincidence, I was sitting next to Ms. Jete, but, but mm -hmm. she was also very concerned, as I am, that we start attaching some dollar figures to some of these things because we know we, there is urgency in spending this money, and I know we approved some training money. Um, I don't know if we can use money for stipends. I know we had kind of a small stipend for instructional aides when we asked them to come, but maybe we can use some of this money to pay teachers to go, instructional assistants to go, and, and really get a move on with some of these trainings and line them up. And I, I know you're doing that already, um, but I guess we have money to spend in this category. We want to make sure we don't lose it. And by this money, Mrs. Deacon, you're referring to the ARRA. The ARRA money, um, exactly, um, Special IDEA education funds, right. okay. <laughs> yes. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, if I have no objection from my fellow board members, I'm going to shuffle the agenda at this point a little bit since we're running late, and I would like to jump to item F4 followed by F6. Item F4 is report on classroom music instructional program. Well, we're implementing the classroom music instruction the program that was provided by the citizens of this community when they approved the parcel tax measure I. And we're anxious to have you know what that looks like. Yes, and this is this is just the first report that um, we will have this year. We hope to have some students later in the year once they've really mastered their instruments a little bit more. But we have almost we have quite a few of our teachers here. Not every single one tonight with us. And um, let's see, we've got well, I'm you know what, Nancy, I'm going to let you come up and introduce. I know Doug and Karen and Kimberly, Sarah. See, I do know them. <laughs> and uh, they have a slideshow that Dave spent quite a bit of time today getting the music going for. And we're, uh, Nancy's going to describe a little bit where we came from, what Measure I has really helped provide as a supplemental program for us this year, and then what we have in the future. And I know you have some handouts here you've read. Nancy? Good evening. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, we have lots of exciting things to report tonight. And the first of those is that thank you to the Santa Barbara Ed Foundation. Uh, they successfully campaigned for Measure H and Measure I uh, last November, and both measures passed by an overwhelming majority. And as a result, we were able to hire five new full-time music teachers this last summer. And most of them are here. I would like to introduce um, the rest of the, the music team that is here. First of all, um, Karen Dutton has been a longtime, full-time member of our elementary teaching staff. And she is, uh, a couple years ago, let's see, just a year ago, um, 
was um, interviewed and was um, offered the position of band director at Santa Barbara Junior High School. So she is transitioning um, into um, from part time or from full time in elementary music to part time and hopefully full time at Santa Barbara Junior High School very soon. So she's our um, our long time <laughs> elementary <laughs> instrumental music teacher and. Uh, with us full-time for the first time this year also is Douglas Troop. He has been with our district, uh, both elementary and secondary district, in many capacities part-time over the last few years. And we're very, very happy to have him with us full-time this year. He is um, a specialist in both band and orchestra instruments. And so he is um, very ver versatile and is is um, helping us tremendously throughout the district and is in fact um, the other half and the better half of our team one here. <laughs> uh, so Doug Douglas and I teach together. <clears throat> we have a um, team two uh, instrumental um, grades four through six uh, instructional team. And Sochi Tafoya is with us here. She is our string specialist. She joined us first time last year as a part-time instructor, part-time music teacher. And we're very, very happy to have her with us this year as a full-time music teacher, string specialist with the 4-6 um, instrumental program. <laughs> and Sochi's um, partner, and uh, a teaching, teaching partner on team two could not be with us tonight. She's taking a course, and her name is Sherry Scripter. She was with us part-time last year. She's a band specialist. We're very happy to have her again um, this year, full-time. And then we have something very, very new this year that we're very excited about. We have, for the first time ever, two credentialed um, kindergarten through third grade music specialists. And I would like to introduce um, Kimberly Ransom <laughs> and Sarah DeSalvo. They are implementing the, the next um, big, exciting phase of our um, district-wide kindergarten through sixth grade comprehensive music program that has been designed to align um, it's sequentially, I would say we're planning to implement it se sequentially with the California State Standards for the Performing Arts. And our goal is to, as soon as we can have the, the kindergarten through sixth grade program fully implemented, is to start meeting those standards. So we're, we're um, many steps closer this year than we were last year. We're in our third year of implementing the, the changes that are needed to get closer to um, fully realizing those uh, standards and, and having students be able to learn them and, and be fully um, competent in them, skilled in them. So this year, what is very exciting is um, we have added uh, music for the entire sixth grade level at all schools, uh, all 10 non-charter schools in the district, and all fourth graders are studying violin, and we will soon, hopefully, be able to implement um, classes for all of the fifth graders. In addition, all of the third graders are studying recorder with Kimberly and Sarah. So this is a huge, huge growth this year. Over last year, we have approximately 600 plus students studying violin in the fourth grade. We will have over 600 students studying uh, string and band instruments in the fifth grade. And we have over 600 students studying um, band and string instruments in the sixth grade and over 600 third graders playing recorders. So I think we have somewhere around uh, 2,600 students studying music once a week with a credentialed music teacher. Uh, 
Um, a very exciting part of this program is the district sponsorship of our after school music program. We are in our third year of this program. It is um, it's housed at Santa Barbara Junior High School. And students, um, the original requirement was that students needed to have one year of instruction on their instrument. But this year we are taking a number of students who are in their first year of instruction on a band or orchestra instrument. And any fourth through sixth grader is welcome. We provide free bus transportation from every single elementary school site to Santa Barbara Junior High School on Tuesdays and Thursdays, Thursday afternoons. And our district staff, instrumental staff, uh, uh, are the instructors there and coaches. We also have one other very, very important person to our program who is not able to be with us tonight. And she is our trombone coach, Madalena Fassetti. She's uh, an hourly um, staff member. And she is a big part of both our in-school program and our after-school program at Bravo. And these um, students come twice a week so that they get a total of three uh, in uh, instructions per week and it makes a huge difference. Um, their inst instruction after school goes from about 320 until 445 and then their parents come and pick them up by 5 o'clock. And last year we noticed a huge difference in just those two extra music lessons per week. The students who came to Bravo far exceeded the skill level and interest level of the students who were taking only one lesson a week through their um, through their schools. So we're very, very excited. This is, this is a dream come true for us, for our students. And uh, we're very happy for the support, both by the, um, the district, the school board, and Santa Barbara Education Foundation. Thank you. Stay put, because we'll probably have <laughs> questions. Okay. Go anywhere, Ms. Madison. Uh, board members, Dr. Noel. I have questions. Uh, this is just great, and uh, and uh, I know how how elated you all must be because you've worked so hard, so long, and through some very meager times. Uh, I want to I want to acknowledge Lanny Ebenstein because it was Lanny's initiative that got the board to consider the parcel tax in the first place, and uh, uh, we're all grateful for that. Uh, question: Continuity all the way up through high school. Are all are all the pieces equally covered now? Because I see this marvelous stream of kids going to be coming out of the elementary schools, going into the junior high schools, and uh, and then I hear then I talk to the high school music programs, and they say we really need the people from the junior highs to keep our programs alive. Well, I guess as elementary um, music teachers, we kind of feel like we're driving the bus from the back. And uh, we're hoping that we, we have so many students coming out of the elementary schools who are interested in, in continuing in the performing arts that um, those, the classes will be able to be filled at the, uh, the secondary level first with junior high and then in probably two or three more years at the high schools. I'm, I'm anticipating a, a huge change in, in the enrollment levels in the performing arts in secondary. I, I talked to, a, at, at, the, at Reno one time when I went with the uh, San Marcos band, I talked to someone from Garfield High School in Seattle. They win all the time. Well, they have this feeder system. It's just this continuity all the way through. They, they, they had auditions for saxophone players for, a high school, for the high school band. Dan Garski would be lucky to get three or four kids. They had 90 applicants. Oh my gosh. Just for saxophone. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think we can inspire quite that much, but, but it's all part of this continuous system. And, and whatever, I don't know what's going on at the secondary well, level now. We should add, in fact, we'll give you a, a lengthier report, but we do have more music classes at the junior high level, which were provided by my major H. Yeah. So, yeah. Great. Again, property tax, that's great. Parcel tax comes through. Thank you very much. And thank you, all of you. Um, Mr. Heron. Yeah. As a saxophone clarinet player from yeah. grade school, through, <laughs> you know, through grade school, junior high, high school, and first year of college, and then it bombed. Um, <laughs> you know, I'm a fan of music. I mean, band got me through junior high school and high school. Um, that was my outlet. You know, but wow. uh, I know Mr. Smith won't like this, but 
it's easy to sit here and say by the end of four years, when the first four years of the parcel tax, we're going to have a fantastic program. And then we have to ask the question, what, what then? And it's easy to sit here and say, oh, we'll just pass another parcel tax and don't worry about it. Uh, I think, you know, we need to be forward thinking and understand this program is going to be successful and somehow in our budgetary process, and I know money scares, obviously, but we still have to face the issue of funding this program into the, into the future. How we do that in the budgetary process or keep, you know, keep that at the forefront, I don't want to be sitting here when we have to cancel these programs. You know, in fact, if that's the case, I probably won't be here. <laughs> but, uh, you yeah, know, I don't want these things canceled. I want them to go on indefinitely. I want them to grow and grow and grow. But we do have to face the issue. And I don't particularly care to go back to the voters all the time for, for special taxes or, uh, you know, uh, special fees. Um, we may have to, but I'm not going to sit here today and say, oh, let's just predicate it on we will. So somehow we all have to be thinking of how do we fund this great program um, into the future. And it may be parcel taxes, but it may be we have to do something else, too. We, we need to be aware of it. Mrs. Deacon? I have a clarinet somewhere in a closet. <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, but my question was about choral music, because that seems like that's so accessible to everyone and doesn't even require an instrument except, I guess, your voice. And I obviously, we have musicians here with instruments, but. Is there a choral component, or could there be one? There could be one with greater resources, and in fact, it is part of, of a master plan that um, Karen Dutton and I presented to the school district um, at the request of, I guess, the district and the Santa Barbara Education Foundation um, probably about seven years ago. Um, it's just a matter of resources. Yeah, um, right now, and uh, just a little bit of history of where we've come from, the district has always um, supported and sponsored the four through six instrumental music program. And then each school site has sort of put together what they could with, with PTA money for uh, a choral program or general music program. And so um, this is a huge piece by providing all sites with the K-6, um, first kindergarten, first and second will be Orschel work, third grade uh, recorder, fourth violin, and then fifth and sixth full strings and, and band. And so that takes, they, that takes a huge piece of that and puts it in place. And I, I think it's just a matter of coming up with resources to complete the picture. And, and they're all learning to read music, which yes. is great, too, yes. because that's the step Absolutely. in any, whatever direction Absolutely. You go. That's yeah. one of the, the top goals for our third, new third grade recorder program this year is that they learn to read music in third grade. So when they come to fourth grade, um, we do some reteaching and reviewing, but there's something familiar or they're well on their way. And then by fifth and sixth grade, we should see much, much stronger skills in that department. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you all. It's wonderful for the brain. Yeah. Um, I'll chime in with I, I've been going to the honor band performances for a number of years and um, seeing the elementary honor band this past year after they've had the year of the Bravo experience going to Santa Barbara Junior High twice, having uh, the extra instruction. Uh, boy, dramatic difference in the performance level for the elementary students. It was really impressive, and you could you could absolutely hear it and see it in what they were doing. Um, so that was terrific. And I also have to say, wow, what a difference just a couple of years makes without the Education Foundation. Oh, yeah. I mean, this yeah. this would have completely collapsed just what two three years ago. It would have been the end. And so yeah. I really thank the Education Foundation for s helping us keep our toe in the water um, through really difficult times and then helping to pass um, measure I in this case to, um, to support this because I think it's going to be a tremendous resource for our students and make a huge difference in their academic achievement as well as their, you know, anything that they can uh, learn in terms of culture and music. So that's wonderful. Um, I know that this is a year of growing pains uh, <laughs> and uh, and there will be more growing pains next year as you expand down to kindergarten. My hope would be that, um, I know one of the issues that keeps coming up is scheduling, and so I hope that maybe scheduling, uh, now that this is, there's some experience under the belt that maybe can be done in the spring so that the some of the schools can start more quickly. Um, we'll see. 
And Ms. Sawaski, you wanted to add in? That was exactly what I was going to talk about. But I wanted to publicly commend and thank all the music teachers because they are absolutely amazing, the most flexible people. Talk about scheduling nightmares. I mean, they have, I can't tell you how many hours <laughs> they have all spent as they're two teams with added people, but they're working together. I mean, midnight, there's emails flying. I mean, trying to get things in place so that every child, you know, like the next morning or the next week gets music and working with the principals. Um, we do have a principal that stepped up, Donna Ronzoni, and volunteered to help supervise and help coordinate. So she has been working with her peers and with the music teachers and um, just doing it in her free time. Mm -hmm. um, so everyone has, has really worked well together, but thank you all for all your work. I, we're just there, I think, <laughs> finally. And um, scheduling should be a lot easier next year, we hope. We've learned a lot this year. Yeah, isn't that Thank a you. visual spatial skill that you learn through music? Kind of yes. Scheduling. <laughs> I call it a very steep learning curve with the <laughs> scheduling. Helps with math. Too. I, I, I have to say, I, I do want to thank you for bringing Brubeck and Johnny Desmond to the board meeting. My favorite, my yes. favorite sax player. That was that was the first time. <laughs> yes. Maybe we should have that sort of playing in the background all the time. That would be it might sort of calm the savage breast at certain times. Um, thank you. Thank you, my pleasure. Okay. And we are moving on now to item F6, jumping ahead to the report from Santa Barbara Education Foundation regarding after school program. I'm gonna ask Tim Schwartz, who's the executive director of the Santa Barbara Education Foundation to introduce this. Tim, it's good to have you back. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, and I'd like to acknowledge the consultant who did the work on this project this this evening too, uh, Susan Epstein, who's sitting in the back. Um, the the pro the genesis of this project came about long before I joined the foundation. Um, really, my understanding is about two years ago. But the fundamental commissioning of this, or the context for the report, was to uh, examine the landscape of music and arts instruction in the elementary schools, and then on the other hand, look at the interest and the capacity of the music music and arts organizations in town to offer their programs within our elementary schools. These were both, and while the agenda points to after school programs, this looked at both sc during school, offering these offerings during school as well as after school. The funding for this uh, assessment was provided by the Santa Barbara Foundation and the Santa Barbara Education Foundation equally. Now, given that I just mentioned it was about the elementary schools, we did have to limit the scope uh, to a reasonable number of schools, otherwise this would have been a very costly assessment. So the scope was limited to the Title I elementary schools, Adams, Harding, McKinley, Franklin, Monroe, and Cleveland. The methodology that Susan uh, deployed on this was quite thorough, um, over 15 different criteria, including inter interviews with principals, teachers, students, numerous musics and art, arts providers, uh, research on education trends affecting um, uh, arts, music instruction in the elementary schools, research on educational goals of arts and music education, and so on. With the discussion we just had about I and H, this assessment took place before that implementation. So quite a bit of the, I wouldn't say quite a bit, but, but a substantial amount of the information that came out changes now with the implementation, implementation of I and H. Clearly there's more activity going on now in the schools with I and H the passage of INH than when this assessment took place. So we see a lot more activity than the principals were able to reflect on at the time they were interviewed. So that changes the, the dynamic a bit, I'd say for the better, uh, but it does change the dynamic in terms of what the assessment was about when the report was written versus the execution on INH, thanks to the teachers here. So I think really the opportunity that we we're looking at with respect to the assessment and the information that was, was um, conveyed is how to really integrate arts into the existing curriculum. This isn't so much now because of the passage of INH how to add to the curriculum, but how you integrate it into the curriculum. And I'll just give you one example. Um, the Education Foundation now has its offices in the Arts and Culture Center up at uh, 1330 State Street. So I have the opera literally two doors down from me. My daughter was in fourth grade last year and one of the fourth, part of fourth grade curriculum in social studies is California Gold Rush. Well, there's an opera about the Gold Rush. So it's how you might bring in the opera, not to again add to the curriculum, because teachers don't have much room to add to their curriculum, but how you can complement what already exists. 
So that's one element that we might be able to look at. And the other, of course, is enhancing existing after-school programs, of which there are many, or again, adding additional after-school programs through music and arts. I will say also that I've had some interesting discussions being in this building, the only non-performing arts arts group in this entire building, that there is a perceived hierarchy in the arts world, music being on the top and dance being on the bottom, and then you have vocal and, and, and theater and drama and these sorts of things in between. So some of these folks have taken even issue with the name of this assessment, but that's not Susan's responsibility. It's just a matter of how these folks look at how music and arts are categorized and seen in the community. So we're looking at these two opportunities, integrating into the curriculum, uh, that the existing curriculum and then after school programs. Some of the challenges that have been identified um, for the schools is aligning the curriculum and the, what they do offer what the, with what the arts groups are offering. And how do you find that information? There is a resource through the Children's Creative Project, but this assessment has suggested a more interactive web-based resource, which I'll talk about in a moment. Assessing the credibility, reliability, and the liability issues of bringing arts groups onto campus uh, is an important issue. S principals are approached, teachers are approached quite often by arts and, and different organizations, but they don't necessarily know if that group will show up the next day, if they're reliable, credible organizations. So that's, that's an important question the schools have. And scheduling, uh, how do you schedule these kinds of things? There are other considerations and challenges, but these are some of the highlights. For the arts groups, uh, it's understanding how their offerings integrate into the standards. So if they, now the opera as an example, understood immediately when I went and talked to them and, and they jumped on it right away. They understand because the, the director of the opera comes from LA and, and, and has had some experience in this. But a number of the arts groups, pro probably I'd say perhaps the majority of the arts groups don't have a clear understanding of how their work might integrate into the content standards of the schools. I mean, the content standards are quite thick and it'd be pretty intimidating as an artist to necessarily go through there and try to see how the, what they do fits. But nonetheless, that is a, it's, a, it's an opportunity and a challenge for the arts groups. Funding. So if we are able to encourage and grow arts, and I say that broadly, arts programming on campus, do the arts groups themselves have the funding? The assessment suggests, and I think that's probably true, that most of them do not. So then how do we go about supporting them so that they can bring their programs onto campus? And then just simply accessing the schools. Um, this is a frustration that the arts community has had with respect to the Santa Barbara schools. In fact, a number of them have said, and these are local arts groups, the bulk of their bookings are not in Santa Barbara, particularly in the Santa Barbara School District. Um, they, and I, I'll quote, Santa Barbara elementary schools are very resistant to our offerings. We used to offer most of our programs in Santa Barbara, but now we have to travel. Um, but they also recognize that with no child left behind, and this is a direct quote, teachers are overworked and can't add more. It's hard to get educators to return calls. So there's an there's a empathy there, but the fact is they've had difficulty reaching into the schools. So the recommendations that came out of the assessment were really four, fourfold. Um, after school, and focused principally on after school programming. After school programming that would serve existing after school programs through AOK and perhaps RAP. And the AOK programs, as you know, are principally managed through the Parks and Recreation. Those sites, the six sites that where those programs exist, currently serve a thousand students, and I think we need to look at the numbers in terms of what it will cost to serve those thousand students. Uh, there are advantages. We need to also develop a matrix, I think, but there are advantages to the AOK sites because those students are required to attend. So for those arts groups that like that, whose programs are built on let's call it a series where, where one lesson builds upon previous lessons, required attendance is important. RAP is a different kind of program where the students are not required to attend, but there are a number of arts groups that are geared toward one-off, if you will, kinds of, of sessions where attending one week doesn't make any difference in terms of what you gain by attending the following week. Uh, so th that's one of the recommendations, is to, is to look at what is already in place in terms of after-school programs, levering that, leveraging that infrastructure, and trying to find a way to bring the arts and music groups into those programs. In addition to that, we could look at the students that are on these six campuses, again, uh, who are not part of AOK or RAP, 
A-OK, -okay, particularly having a waiting list. So that would be an additional 1,500 students and looking at even p the potential of hiring a coordinator to just serve now what would be a total of 2,500 students. I think that's a sizable number. That's about 95% of all six of those students' schools population. So I think that's pretty ambitious. But there's the idea of you start with what you have in place and then expand it to these Title Ones. I'd like to see some us do a little bit more research beyond just the Title Ones and see what the interest is in the other, other, other elementary schools. But again, we had to limit the focus and scope of this report. Third recommendation had to do and was focused on the promotion and exchange of information of the arts groups and how the schools access that information. The principal tool and vehicle for that right now is the Children's Creative Projects Art Catalog, which is this. It's a hardbound book. Susan found um, some very interesting and highly um, informative, interactive kind of websites, web-based tools, online tools where the data was cut and you can look at the information by artists in any number of different ways. That's a tool, I'm calling it the tool, web-based tool that seems to be gaining in terms of some of the, the conversations that we've been having with folks. Uh, it seems to be a tool that a lot of folks would like to see. Um, the quite, and, and there are samples of this. It's not re we wouldn't necessarily be recreating the wheel. Orange County, San Francisco, a lot of different districts and organizations around the state have these tools in place. The question for me still is, if we build it, will they come? That's not, to me, altogether clear. I do think the answer is probably yes, but I don't want to go forward and pull a trigger on a project until I know the answer is yes. The principal users of this catalog are PTAs. Will teachers be inclined to use this online tool if we put it up and build it? And I, again, my, if I had to bet, my answer would be yes, that they would. But I want to do a little bit more research to, to confirm that. Then the fourth recommendation really had more to do with training and professional development, which reflects back on the comments I made earlier with having to do with content standards and linking up those standards with the arts organizations and helping training and professionally developing those arts organizations to better understand how what they do fits the curriculum and standards within the classrooms because as I said, the majority of those folks do not. And there has been a, Susan uh, did a good job in assessing how many of those groups, at least of those that she was interviewed, were interested and would be willing to participate. And there was a, a, a good show of hands, if you will, in terms, of, in terms of following through with that. Some of the considerations, again, tools and from the tools, the web-based tools, is if, if we build it, will they come? Will teachers use the site? What functionality is critical? How is scheduling and booking managed? Some sites, some of these sites that we looked at, uh, they manage that on uh, within the site. What organizations in this in this community have the capacity to to keep that kind of material and that kind of site up to date and and well well managed? And is there any sort of fee for service for doing that? Um, there's a two way bridge, so it's fine to put up a site. But if the teachers start calling the artists, do they have the funding to to respond? And that's a critical, we, having a one-way bridge doesn't do us much good. We have to have a two-way bridge for this to work. So we need to really uh, look at the arts groups and the funding availability. I've talked to a number of foundations who are a little bit frustrated with the fact that they get 40, 50 proposals from arts groups asking for funding. So they're looking to us to try to sort of perhaps use this assessment and what we might learn from it, particularly toward execution as a way of, of, of streamlining that process with with respect to the arts communities going to them for funding. And then does professional development differ for groups that are integrating into curriculum versus single performances that might have, groups that would provide single performances during assemblies, during school time, or for after school, professional development content standards during school versus professional development after school. I think that professional development is important, but I think you're gonna be looking at different trainings and different, different kinds of information that would be exchanged. Uh, I think we need to look and talk with the resident artists. Um, this assessment focused principally on performing artists, and there are a large, large community of resident artists that I think need to be consulted further before any execution is, is uh, taken on this report. Um, there are also a few other stakeholders that I think we need to confer with, I think further with the Children's Creative Project, uh, the district curriculum officers. Um, I've started to schedule some meetings with those folks. It hasn't happened yet. 
uh, the county's arch commission uh, and other folks that I think are important stakeholders in the in what we might do with this report. And it, so where I'm sitting right now with my board and with this group discussions with Brian, um, we're weighing what the Santa Barbara Education Foundation's priorities are now that we sort of have a clean state, slate with music off the ground and running. Um, and we are, by the way, we do have the I and H on our radar and uh, it's not too soon to start campaigning if that's the way we, <laughs> if that's the way we need to go. Um, but we're looking at our own priorities uh, against what the district's priorities are and not against but actually in, in concert with the district priorities in terms of what we do with this proposal against other needs. Um, but I think either way to really accurately reflect what we do with this we need to consult with additional stakeholders and I'd like to convene a sample of teachers, principals, artists to look at the report, to critique the report, to identify any critical questions that still need to be addressed. Um, these are the groups that would be actively engaged with one another, they should take a look at this report as a draft, which is where it stands today, and see if they can poke holes in it and find out where the weak spots are, find out where the strengths are, learn from that, and then we might have some, some more concrete action items. Really have them help shape what the execution might be in terms of the next step. So that's the quick summary of this, this activity. I think Susan did a, f a fabulous job. I think with any good assessment, there are a lot of good and more additional questions that come from it, and I think we really need to look at some of these additional questions before moving forward. Thank you, Mr. Schwartz. Any comments, board members? Mrs. Deacon. As someone who's been attending the uh, Education Foundation meetings, I had a chance to get a sneak preview at this report, and I have to say I thoroughly enjoyed reading it. It was really illustrative and it gave so many good ideas and the, the quotes from the teachers and the principals yeah. um, and the students themselves really opened my eyes to a lot of uh, the potential for so many more opportunities and I, I, th I see this as a, as a bridge opportunity for the Education Foundation which has been so firmly grounded in music mm -hmm. to, to expand and grow and still keep that, that tradition but offer new opportunities to the students, um, I'm hoping all the, all the board will get a chance to see and, re and read the report. Um, I was really interested in the, the interactive web-based piece that, that we'd been talking about at some mm -hmm. of our meetings, and I know in Orange County they have a, a system where this is done where, where teachers can actually just go online, find an org organization that might mm -hmm. adapt the curriculum they're teaching at a particular time, and I, I'm not sure if the standards are actually provided as well by that organization, but but that's a piece, I think, isn't it? It does show the matrix. It's in a, you can break it down, you can look at dance, you can look at vocal, you can look at just about any sort of art type, let's say, and then you can look at all of the groups following, following under that type and then what standards they meet. Mm -hmm. So whether it's social studies or math or, yes, so you right. it does have a nice matrix in the Orange County right. case. And it would, you'd need training for some of the artists perhaps to integrate those standards. Absolutely. Um, and training for the teachers to use a tool like this, and, and I'm not sure if this is where the Education Foundation is going to go with this or not, but um, it has a lot of promise, I think. Well, probably, and the, the principals, I think the, the principals and the teachers are very aware of the benefits of bringing these things into the classrooms. The conflict is time, how to do it, how to do it creatively. They'd love to do it. They recognize the value. It's simply a matter of, of, of time and bandwidth within the school day. That's why I, we, in my consultations with Brian, I think are initially focusing, will probably go toward how we might execute this first, or at least focused principally at, on after school to begin with. Mr. Heron. Uh, have you by chance met Michelle Magnuson from the County Education Office, Partners in Education? No, I know Ben Romo, but I've not met, met no. Michelle. Michelle is in charge of a program that does what, what you're talking about to some degree. All the teacher has to do is say, I, I need a fourth grade science speaker on this topic. Yeah, that's what the Children's Creative Project probably No, no, no? this is a Partners in Education. And, and oh, Michelle, the Speakers Bureau, yes. Yeah, Michelle yeah. knows specifically what the grade level requirements are, okay. standards. Yeah, I know what you and, mean. And all the teacher has to say, I want them at 10 o'clock on Thursday. Mm -hmm. And Michelle finds the person or the entity of the organization and says to the teacher, they'll be there. Mm -hmm. It's all pre, um, you know, the, the, it, everything is done for the teacher. So the teacher, all the teacher has to do is go online and say, here's what I want, period. 
And that's where I think this could be really helpful right. in terms of integrating into existing curriculum. Yeah, so yeah, I agree. Yeah, so you may want to meet with Michelle because mm -hmm. she spent an, she's got a huge database of uh, teachers, of teachers' needs, of speakers, of organizations that mm -hmm. will do it just about anything a teacher wants. So you may want to chat with her. Sure. Thank you. Dr. Noel. Uh, I, it just occurred to me the, on the question of integrating the curriculum, uh, are you at all working with Nevada? Not yet. We have not. We, presumably I, they have got arts content already woven into the uh, language arts and other parts. They of the do. Curriculum. They're sitting at the high school, correct? Yeah. Santa Barbara High School. We're looking principally at the elementary level, but we might be able to learn some lessons from the teachers at Nevada and perhaps even the students. Yeah. Um, I would like to request, because not all board members have seen the report, mm -hmm. so if we could get that report in the board brief, sure. yes. that would be great. Yes. Sure. And um, I'm really interested in the after school aspect to this. Uh, what I see, what's frustrated me for many years is this, this report looks at the Title I schools, but if you then looked at the non-Title I mm -hmm. schools, and I shouldn't call them non-Title I schools necessarily, but higher socioeconomic schools, um, they, there's a, an enormous disparity between what's offered after school in terms of actual enrichment activities mm -hmm. and who gets to take that and who, and who doesn't have access to it. And, but at the same time, for our high socioeconomic schools, there's, it's a lot of work for these parent groups to, to put on what they're putting on. Um, and there's issues of cost and liability. And um, th I think that there's frustration at all of our schools. Everybody wants to do this for, this for the kids, but if you don't coordinate, then it's uneven access and it's very difficult for the schools that are doing it. So I, would, I think that there'd be a lot of parent interest in it, and I, there were a lot of great points that were raised. Well, your idea of these schools that are already doing it, they may have the model or the mechanisms in place that we need to replicate. Again, if we don't have to recreate the wheel, let's mm -hmm. not. But the funding issues are going to be the, the differentiator. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And um, board members, we're, we're running behind time. So I think I'm going to go ahead and pull item F7, the continuation of first reading of board policies 4000 series. I know that'll disappoint you. <laughs> and at this time, we're going to be back. It'll be back. Uh, we'll go to <laughs> F2, update on, not F2, sorry, I'm trying to skip. Yep. Go back to poor Mr. Guajardo. Um, F3, report on Federal American Recovery and Reinvestment Act era funds. This money has been important to our, to our budget. Uh, however, it's only one-time money. Uh, but Meg will give you a report on where we stand. Good evening. Yes, we got five different buckets of money on the ARA money. The first one was the stabilization um, the state fiscal stabilization funds, which came to us pretty much, it was our largest amount of m funds and the m least restricted. It's basically to retain teachers, and that's exactly what we spent it on. Um, once the payroll hit this in September, we moved all the funds from all the expense out of the 1,000s and put them into the 3,200s. So we fully expended. Uh, the state fiscal stabilization funds by the end of September. The next one was the Child Nutrition Equipment Assistance Grant, and this is also one-time funding. And, um, Child Nutrition got $55,000, and they put it towards their mobile cafe, and that has been fully expended also as of um, September. Title I, supporting low-income schools, one-time once again, most of that money was, or half of that money was spent on Read 180, and the rest basically has been allocated through sites into the district. As you can see, that's, that's budgeted to be fully expended. Um, the allocation to the sites was just, this was just done at the end of September, and so now the sites have the money to get ready to spend. But as far as our is concerned, the district level, we have given it out to the sites at this time. The special education IDEA money is used to enhance special education. And as you can see, we still have quite a bit of funds in this um, area. And as Ms. Deakins mentioned, that I am eager to put some um, programs towards this, and whether it's the training or 
whatever we come up with with the stakeholders group. So I'm sure that we can get some of that money used up. If we don't spend some of this money collectively through the SELPA, the members of the SELPA community, um, we could possibly lose the second funding source, which will be coming, they say, by December. So we filled out our expense report, and hopefully as collectively as a SELPA, we will hit that targeted amount. But I'm not even sure the state has a targeted amount yet. So. Um, the preschool special education entitlements and grant is kind of um, um, a strange situation because we got 50% of it back in June, at the very end of June, and right away we had to give that back. But nobody knew at first that we had to give it back to the county. So we had to pay a little bit of um, interest on that, but we did send it back to the SELPA. And then they turn, they're going to turn around, which they have, and given us the other 50%, which we can use any way we want, as long as it's in special ed. So that's, that was just like an extra pot of money that we weren't anticipating. So as you can see on the second page, I've broken out how we've spent that, all the money, and where we have money left. Where I, in the preschool entitlement, and um, special education entitlement and special education grant, I put it towards the contribution, but that's not necessarily where we have to put it. We can put it towards anything we want to do with it. So that's, that's pretty much of a budget until the stakeholders and everyone else um, decide on how to spend the money in special education. Any questions? Dr. Noel. That's how much is remaining. That's the balance. And what are the constraints on that? Well, we have to have, we can't, we can't supplant. We have to supplement. And um, we have to enhance our program. And it has to be towards special education. And you said something about a time limit? Well, there's, um, well, we have until the end of, as September. soon as possible. I yeah. mean, the issue is you have time, but there's going to be a reporting mechanism that's going to be reported back through the SELPA that CDE is going to evaluate. And you have to remember that since these are our, are our dollars, one of the first tenets is to spend them and get them on the street as soon as possible. Obviously, we've done a fairly good job with respect to the other categories, but we've had, you know, um, leadership in those areas where <laughs> we had nobody in special ed. So I think we are hindered in that regard. Um, a couple other issues I just might as well address with regard to the state fiscal stabilization funds, as early as second interim report of last year, we've al always identified that we were going to move certificated salaries into that to basically retain teachers and basically offset the structural deficit, and that's exactly what we did. Um, we had to report by the first, by September 23rd, how we'd spend those dollars through September 30th. We have done that. As you can see, with respect to the state fiscal stabilization funds, we've spent 94 percent. With regard to Title I, I believe a large amount of that was consumed by the Read 180 initiative, which I do believe that the board approved as well. 
um, the special ed IDEA, there's a significant amount of money still left there that the board has discretion over as long as it deals with the supplanting restrictions, as Meg pointed out. And then there's a tiny bit in preschool special ed entitlement, which is basically more flexible, and the board still has discretion over those dollars as well. Dr. Noel? The first category isn't, is not. Is not. <laughs> yeah, because you have to remember state fiscal stabilization funds, we actually got in two different apportionments. Out of the roughly $5 million there, we got $4 million really by June 30th of last year, and the intent of that was to offset the revenue limit reductions or deficit. The second $1 million, which we got a little bit later, was to offset the categorical deficits. So basically the purpose of those dollars were basically to grant us relief from the deficits that the state applied to both the revenue limit and categoricals with the underlying, you know, tenant that basically we're going to try and stimulate the economy, retain jobs, et cetera, et cetera. So that's a little bit different than the other categories. It, it, it's really interesting when you read the advisories, and they're thick, um, you can do a, a large number of things with that first category, with that first category, with the exception of things like build athletic stadiums, renovate swimming pools. I, <laughs> the things that are prohibited are really interesting, and there's not very many, but there's a few, and those are the kind of things, yeah, very specific. Supplement only, not supplement. Yes. How do we have a firm? Uh, what kind of accountability system do we have in place, for example, that the money that's allocated to sites will be used only to supplement, not to supplement? Can, can you I wanna, take a You want to address that? Well, for one reason, when these, when the sites go in and make a requisition, for example, they'll go through our requisition process, and if it's using um, Title I funds, it has to go through our compliance officer, Dr. White. So she will look at that and see if whatever they're purchasing is enhancing a program because she knows everything that's going on with Title I funding at each of the sites. If, if you are spending money for something that you would not other, that you would otherwise have spent money for, you're supplanting. If you're spending money for something you would not otherwise have spent it for, you're supplementing. And I'm not, and and, and that can be subtle, obviously. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm I'm concerned mostly because I recall sometime in the past that we got nicked on an audit and had to pay some money back, but so that was used from Title One money that was use the supplant rather than to the supplement. And I'd hate to see us <laughs> two months from now uh, uh, have that happen with this, especially with this one, a lot of these large amounts of money. So I'm concerned about accountability on that issue. Uh, and then, uh, particularly in that Title I one, uh, where it goes to the site, where the, you know, the farther away it goes, the, the harder it control is. But th everything pretty much runs through the district office. It, they cannot hire anyone until it goes through all the appropriate. Can someone here make that judgment? This is, this is money Absolutely. Something that was, okay. Well, I, I should answer that as well. And Dr. White knows those rules. She's asked to rule on it, and she does. I don't <laughs> sign anything off unless Dr. White has signed it with and, any of the federal funds. And just so you know, in, in terms of our online requisitioning process, our approval paths are set up very specifically. So if there's a categorical compliance component, she has to sign off on it before it's moved on to the authorizing agent to issue a purchase order. So she sees everything. Uh, Dr. Sarvis, your reassurance about Dr. White is very helpful. But that still doesn't answer the question of how 
that this is accountable in anything beyond outside of, of that office. And, and we as a board are really responsible to make sure these funds are spent properly. And I, would, I think we, that would be very helpful if there was some kind of a loop. We have and another level. We have another level as well in our uh, in our categorical accountants. So that's a that's another catch level safety net. Uh, last one, I just wanted to know. Uh, am I hearing you correctly that we've got uh, two two million six hundred thousand, almost two million two million seven hundred thousand dollars in federal funds for special education that has to be spent right away as long as we are using it to supplement not the plan. That's, that's, that's the first, that's part A of my question. Should that's, be spent right away. That it should be spent. I, I'm encouraging that we spend it so that we ha are entitled to the next round. And, and the other, the Do other the issue cell phone. too, as Meg will explain, is you saw there's interest charges on that money. The longer we hang on to that, the feds charge us interest. And that's why that line item occurs in each one of those categories. And that's on any federal funding. that were added the job descriptions approved in April for some of that was new. Uh, are any of those new jobs, at least the first year of those jobs? Uh, kind of which which are the special ed? Directors and, and oh, directors and program yeah, specialists. Yeah. Yes. Uh, are, are any of those, uh, could we, is that, that doesn't sound like it's supplanting, it's a new position. No, I think it was always contemplated that we would charge at least the beginning of that, you know, we would charge those against the special ed RF funds, at least at the beginning. And Dr. Miller is fully charged in that area. And, and, and the, the position with that would also be in 3313, which is the special education. Could, could we get a, a plan uh, for how that money is going to be spent? Uh, well, I think that's what. I think that's what we're, the stakeholders are going to do soon. I don't think the stakeholders have told us they've got a couple million bucks to spend. Well, I was there to tell them, but nobody asked me. <laughs> I was ready with my calculator last night. I was ready to go. Yes. Well, but by prioritizing what they did last night, training, now I can say, okay, how much is it going to cost to train? And I can put a budget number towards that. And we can start yeah. allocating that money out. Let, let me say, though, that's going to come back to the board before we spend money. It's going to be with your approval. And we're going to bring back the priorities to the board and make recommendations as to what we spend money on and ask for your approval on it. That's, yes. Can I just, it's just so un, it's just so illogical to spend the money and then come back with the, with the approval when in fact we should be looking at the plan for the spending of right. money so we can react to it and give, and, 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 and at least, well, yeah, at least just as the other thing. items. All on right, let's go ahead and give opportunity right. here. Um, any other comments, Mrs. Deacon? Uh, I'll make this quick. Um, I'm sure every, everyone feels this way, but there's nothing worse than feeling like you're being told you have to spend all this money right away without <laughs> being able to do the research and the thinking behind spending it sm in a smart way. But I, I think we need to ask our special education staff to, to, to make this a huge priority. And, and the stakeholders group's not going to meet again for a while, so I think maybe we need to let them know that if they have any creative ideas about equipment we need to buy, you know, adaptive technology, we're listening because we, we know we have resources to get that information, and so um, I think we probably need to do that right away. Thank you. Mr. Heron. What, dir what, what directions were given to the sites as to how to spend the money or, or in what time frame? I think that would be a Ms. Swalski question. <laughs> <laughs> what directions were given to the staffs as to how much they got and what they can spend it on and what parameters and by when. For Title I? Yeah, they allocated the sites, 439000 that, that has just happened, and so we, we will be talking with them. I mean, they, it's, I, I guess it's in their, is it in their budgets now? It is in their it's budgets, and they were allocated by, I believe it was seabeds. That the, okay. That's how it was allocated. And um, 
as of the end of September, that's in their budget, so they know they have it. But it, were there instructions as to what it can be spent for, how it can be spent? Well, the, this is T for Title I purposes, and they have long experience. Okay. Oh, yes, it's, what's yes. It's the exactly. Same, the same rules apply. They and know they better be buying instruction. Right. Okay. And all of their, <laughs> their purchases, of course, like Meg said, have to go through the district office. Principals aren't able to just spend right. it on their own. It has to go through that whole checking process. Okay. Uh, today we approved to come some purchase orders for Envision math books, um, but it was charged to special ed. Can you explain? Because um, some of our special ed classrooms didn't have the core curriculum in there, although we asked, and uh, it kind of goes back to what Michael Gonzalez was talking about as far as making sure we have all the books in all the classrooms. When we do the ordering in the spring, we make we give the instructions that you know every child, as far as they know what their their enrollment is going to be, and every special ed classroom has the core curriculum. And we found that in some cases the special ed classrooms did not have that. And in many cases, they have teachers have to have different levels. You know, they have to have the teachers' additions for several grade levels and all. So those kinds of things are very appropriate because they're special ed students. Okay. Um, Doctor Noel, I. Okay, um, I just wanted to say um, most of these things we did see, and we we voted on these, and we saw that they were coming from ERA funds. Um, it's just interesting to see it together as a package um, because usually we see it in isolated bits. So it's nice to have this as an uh, an update, and I appreciate that. Um, and uh, like everybody else, I'm very eager to see what the special education plan is for for spending money. It's it's a nice position to be in. I'd rather be in this position than other positions in terms of not having the money. So um, I'm sorry that we may not have as much time as we'd like to, to flush things out, but I certainly hope we move forward with it. So a, a quick well, finale, I, Dr. I, Noel. Really, you have to make my point. I, I thought we already bought Reed 180. I thought we made a decision to adopt that and that's We did, and that's, I'm this. showing where it, the money was spent, and that was in Read 180. Yes, because we re we received some we received this money in June, and so we used that Title One ARA money to buy Read 180. Okay, good. <laughs> I wish there were parents here who could hear that. <laughs> I think he's being facetious. <laughs> um, it is 10.30. And uh, we have one item left on the agenda that I have not pulled at this point, and that's F5, Report on Sustainability Initiatives. Board members, poor Mr. Hedyank has already sat through this one time without being able to make this presentation. Oh, do we have an, a speaker on F3? F3, I'm sorry. So Mr. I'm going to, I'm going to, before we have Mr. Wheeler go up though, I just would like a quick decision. Are we going to go on to F5 or, um, cause we still need to go back to item D13. Um, cause I, well, my opinion is it's too important to do late and rush. So I'm, I'm sorry for Mr. Hedyank, but I know he'll be here at our next meeting or, or meeting after that, okay. I'd rather spend more time on it. Other board members in agreement with that? Yeah. I'll make a motion. We go into eleven o'clock. <laughs> Ooh, and there's no second. <laughs> Dang. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so we will pull F five uh, and come back to that report on sustainability initiatives at another agenda. And at this point, uh, for F three, we have public comment from Mr. Lane Wheeler. I'll be brief. Um, in Title I funds, I'm thinking uh, school site improvement plan, and uh, I would like to make sure that the school site councils are aware of what they're getting and what the requirements are for uh, them to blend that into their plan to improve student performance. Um, oftentimes, that information gets disseminated through the principal, and sometimes that information, as a result of that dissemination, gets modified somehow. So I'd like to make sure that the um, school site council chairs are at least aware of what they have to spend and, and you know, and the time frames and that sort of thing so that they can hopefully make good decisions based on what will help improve student performance and, and whatever criteria they need to meet on that one. So if that can happen, it'd be great. Thanks. Thank you. All right. 
We are now back at item G, returning to consent items designated for discussion. We had one left, it was D13, which is approval of the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act Cooperative Transition Partnership Program contract for the 2009-10 school year. So that's it. Dr. Noel. Well, I, the first thing that, that uh, struck my mind was the uh, curious juxtaposition of the word transparency with the criteria for the program. And down here under the funding source, resource number 3410. And, and I spent a lot of time in the California Schools Accounting Manual, but I cannot remember what resource 3410 is. And I, my guess is two members of the public can. Federal ARA. It's a it's a federal ARA A R R A resource. Well, my, my point simply being that 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 plain language would serve you. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, much more to the point, and less picky. Uh, it doesn't say how much from resource thirty four ten. How much is the value of the contract? That's that's because I um, the contract's not there. I thought that was going to be attached to it so we can yeah there's nothing there so I apologize for that I don't know exactly how that wasn't included well, can we pull this until we have that contract Tom can, can we pull item D13 until our next meeting the approval of the American Recovery and Re Reinvestment Act cooperative transition partnership program contract for 0910 because we have not seen the contract for it it's not with the attachment. How can we approve a contract we haven't read? I'm sorry, um, so what? Yes, the, um, the, the, on the, um, transition partnership program, the enhancement, the extra, the ARA dollars that are, that are, um, enhancing this program. Supplementing the program, there's a there's a contract that went with this, and um, it's not in the attachments here, and so the dollar amount is not clear. So the question is, is the timing okay to bring this back at the next board meeting? And I I don't know what how the transition program is working exactly with this. We uh, or is it time sensitive? No, we, we can bring it back, and I do uh, I do have the backup contract here, and I don't know for whatever reason didn't didn't yeah, make it I'm into the packet, but uh, this is a 20 plus year partnership that we've had, and it's to enhance the uh, relationship we have with the transition and and uh, and the com business community to prepare students in that program for uh, post secondary uh, life. All right, uh, that will come back to us at our next board meeting. Thank you. And I, and I might add that I I concluded after reading this that this is clearly to supplement, not to supplant. Okay. Um, I move to, a, to a pull it, or I guess you don't move it. We don't move. We'll okay. just we'll oh. go ahead and pull it. Um, I went on to item H, coming events. We did get a list of that um, at the beginning. Um, item I, board comments and correspondence. Anything the board members want to share? Um, I Deacon. just want to make sure, and I, I'm sorry we didn't actually do this when Tim Schwartz was here, that everyone knows that um, on December the 8th, Tuesday, December the 8th, there's going to be a benefit concert. Um, Michael McDonald is performing, but it's a benefit for the Santa Barbara Education Foundation, and you can buy VIP tickets for $125 and meet him and schmooze, but, but you can also buy less expensive tickets and... Um, there's some opportunities for sponsors as well. So I know I'm going, my husband's gonna go too. So um, I hope the other board members will consider going as well and supporting the Education Foundation. Absolutely, Mr. Heron. Uh, yes, we went, several of us went to several fascinating um, visits at schools this past couple of weeks. Um, but the one, uh, one trivia is that the governor did sign the military uniform for gra at graduation. So he did sign that, so now uh, that's no longer <laughs> fine. <laughs> yeah, and uh, there was some minor wording changes, but nothing that changes our policy very much. I did go to Harding School today for the UCSB uh, lab school initial presentation and, and study group, which I found fascinating. Okay. Um, 
next up is item J, future agenda items. Um, any future agenda items from board members? Um, one thing that I would like to talk about, because we, we have, a, a, as you can tell, a very large agenda item coming up shortly, and that is the Cesar Chavez Charter Renewal. Um, at this point, uh, it's looking likely that that will come to our November 10th meeting. But because that will take so much time on the November 10th meeting, I'm wondering if it would be possible to schedule a special meeting um, to try to clear other board b business um, because that's going to take a large chunk of time. And I'm wondering if board members would be amenable to meeting on um, the Tuesday before, November 3rd, if I can get a quorum to take care of uh, as many things as possible at that meeting. Is that okay with you, Dr. Noel? And I will Deacon? be out of town. You'll be out of town? Okay. Will you be here, Mrs. Deacon? Okay. So we know that we'll at least have a quorum as long as three of us are able to vote, uh, vote affirmatively on as many <laughs> things as possible. Hopefully Mrs. Cordero can come. <laughs> um, so that moves us on to item K. So with no objection from the board at this time, we will adjourn.